Good evening, everyone. This is the uh, regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. It's Wednesday, September 6, 2017. It's a little bit after 6 o'clock. We're starting late, and I apologize. I wasn't paying attention to the clock. Um, this evening, uh, this is a call to order of that meeting. However, before we move into the Pledge of Allegiance roll call on our business, well, I actually need to take an item out of order and um, take up order number 17-82, act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title I, MRSA 405.6.E in consultations with legal counsel regarding a legal matter pertaining to pending litigation related to the Higgins Beach Piney Point Prouts Next Tax Abatement Appeals. Is there a second to the motion? Should we call it? Is it what I called to order? Already did. Oh, okay. Those present? Okay. Um, well, the way that I was told to do it by the clerk is I do roll call when we come back. Pledge of Allegiance and roll call when we come back. Um, at, second? Thank yes, you. Second. Um, and just for the public, um, we will go into, with the vote, we will go into uh, to, um, executive session and return to the regular meeting and start with the Pledge of Allegiance at approximately 7 p.m. Um, all in favor of the executive session? And that is unanimous. Thank you.
Good evening, folks. This is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. It is Wednesday, September 6th. Uh, we actually started our meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, for an executive session and took that item out of order. We are actually moving on to item number two, and if you can rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. If the clerk can do roll call, please. Councilor Donovan? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Piazzo? Here. Chairman Baybay? Here. Moving on to the next item, item number four is the general public comments. If you would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda, you're welcome to come to the podium. Otherwise, any comments regarding an agenda item should be reserved for that item when it is brought forward. Good evening. My name is Mike Doyle. I own FelmaToday.me. I'm here to uh, give the council two warnings tonight, your first one and your last one, about content-based speaking. This is a letter from the Maine Civil Liberties Union to the town council in Falmouth, Maine. It's dated May 12, 2010 to Kathy Breen, who is currently the chair at the time. And it's regarding Falmouth resolution and proposed council rules changing changes regarding free speech. Dear Ms. Breen, I'm writing on behalf of the Maine Civil Liberties Union as a cooperating attorney to express our concern over the resolution passed by the Falmouth Town Council on May 10, 2010, called the resolution, and the proposed changes to council rules called the rule change that may be enacted on May 24, 2010. Both the resolution and the rule changes attempt to restrict the exercise of free speech in a political environment in direct contravention of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. I understand that both the resolution and the rule changes were motivated by what were seen as personal attacks on you and other counselors. However, the type of speech that was identified in the resolution and the rule changes could include protected political speech. Both the resolution and the rule changes banned certain speech based on its content, like your cockamamie rules over here. Both the resolution and the rule changes ban content-based speech, and the content-based restrictions are presumptively unconstitutional in RAV versus City of St. Paul, 505 U.S. 377, 382, 1992. In order to meet the constitutional muster, such a restriction must survive strict scrutiny and be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling state interest. The rule changes do not come close to meeting that standard. We applaud the sentiments expressed elsewhere in the resolution that recognize that public comment may include criticism. Unfortunately, this sentiment is then negated by the resolve that name calling and personal attacks and abusive bullying and threatening language will not be tolerated at any time during council meetings or through council correspondence. Unpleasant comments are an, an open, excuse me, an unavoidable part and per, perhaps an essential part of the hurly-burly of living in a free and open democracy. Justice Brandeis wrote, the freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. Whitney v. California, 274 U.S. 357, 375, 1927. Brandeis concurring. The freedom inevitably, inevitably results in speech that some find undesirable. <coughs> However, because we are a country that values free speech so highly, and because the courts are understandably cautious about pre uh, granting government the power to regulate speech, a content-based restriction must meet stringent requirements be found constitutional. Because the rule changes do not meet these requirements, they should not be implemented. Consequently, we strongly urge the Falmouth Town Council to reject the proposed amendments to the Falmouth Council rules as unconstitutional. In addition, we condemn the Council's passage of the resolution that attempts to limit protected speech. If you wish to discuss this matter further, you may contact me or Zachary Hayden Esquire, the legal Director of the Maine Civil Liberties Union, signed Kelly McDonald. Thank you.
Is there anybody else who would like to get up and speak? Ms. Roy? Judy Roy, 2nd Avenue. Um, just thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. Um, I haven't attended many council meetings since I was on the council, but I spent 15 years on the council, and the August 16th meeting was disturbing to me personally. I walked away from it feeling appalled, disheartened, angry, and saddened by the demeanor of some of the speakers, and I apologize on behalf of the, ma the silent majority that are out there in the town of Scarborough. Uh, I think that's not the way to uh, conduct our business. There were many times when you were accused of not listening, and I begged the question to everybody else, who's not listening? Uh, I think everybody has to listen on both sides of the coin. We operate under a town manager town form of government, and all seven of you represent all of the citizens of the town of Scarborough, and you have to weigh each situation and how it relates and how it affects all the citizens of the town of Scarborough, as opposed to the selectman form of government where it depended on how many of your friends of your persuasion you could bring to the meeting and how late they could stay up. And that still happens to this day. Um, I ask that the silent majority stand up and speak out. I ask that those that have questions certainly get involved. Get involved in the government process volunteer for committees. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. That's what's not happening at this point. We have people coming forward at the 11th hour when lots of work has been done over the previous several months on any particular committee or problem that they've been dealing with. And <clears throat> one of the other things, just to comment on the ad hoc budget committee, I think it's a bad idea. I think if we read our charter, it's very clear that the council has the duty under the charter to take care of the, the finance uh, aspect as far as budgets are concerned. But certainly we want citizen involvement to ask questions, to get clarification, and I hate this word, and to be as transparent as you can be. And I always worked under the auspices of do the best for the most with the least, and I think that's what we continue to do when we look for better ways to do it all of the time. But we need to start learning to be civil to each other and work together on both sides of the aisle so that we can do the things that make Scarborough the great town that it was. I was so disheartened after that meeting, I, I actually wanted to go find a realtor and put a for sale sign on my house. And I've lived in that house for 44 years. I've lived in Scarborough for 65, but I'm only 39. <laughs> so, so I've taken in a lot in those 39 years. But I just wanted to try to give you a little bit of some uplifting feeling that, that there are those of us out there who rep recognize the hard work that everybody does. Uh, when I was a counselor, I probably attended 15 or 20 meetings a month. And when we were first on, when I was first on the council, we got whopping three hundred and fifty dollars. Mm. Not much in this this day and age. So keep doing the work that you do. Keep trying to find the right answers. Certainly seek the it, the help of the silent majority. I think that's the group that we're missing. And if you don't like what some councilors are doing, certainly the public has the right not to vote for you the next time you run. But that's the risk you take. But do the right thing. Do the best for the most with the least. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Larry Hartwell, 9 Jordan Drive. At last week's finance committee meeting on Thursday, at the very end, I was asked, I asked a question about the newspaper report on 200 lost ballots from the July vote that showed up sometime late in August. I asked if the town councilors there or the town manager would like to comment on what happened. Chairman Baybuy replied, this was a finance committee meeting, and he would discuss after the meeting. So now we have a town council meeting. I again ask the chair or the town manager, would they comment on this tonight? If not, when? Today we learned, this is kind of like deja vu from last week. Today we learned that several hundred votes, early votes from yesterday's third vote, were left in a vault and not included in the reported tolls last night. The public has a right to 
to a complete explanation of both of these problems. How can the town council certify the July vote and yesterday's vote with the issues that are before us? And now today we've called in apparently the state to come in and audit our voting procedures. The certification of these two votes should be tabled until the state does their audit and makes findings and recommendations. Citizens voting no, voting yes, or choosing not to vote expect. No, they demand voting results are beyond reproach. We are no longer at that point. So am I going to get any comment, are we, the public, going to get any comment on, on these irregularities from July or, or from? Yes, I actually, I'll make a comment. I'd be happy to answer your question. First, I need to be accurate in their statement that you made. I actually did not say that we would discuss this after the last meeting. What I said it was that it would be discussed at the town council meeting, which is the more appropriate forum. I also suggested to everyone in the room, which did not have a reporter in the room, I said that I would also answer any questions after that meeting and not one person asked me a question, including you, sir. So tonight's agenda actually does have an agenda item that will have this discussion. There will actually be an adjustment to the agenda to talk, take up um, a similar issue under order number 17-090. So that will be where this conversation occurs. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Public comments? Not seeing any, I'm gonna close the public comments and move into um, Item number five, minutes, August 16th, 2017, um, regular meeting. Is there a motion from council to accept? Move approval. Second. Second. Any modifications, edits, or um, corrections for the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Um, adjustments to the agenda. I will be passing out um, an item that I'm asking uh, for consideration to be added to the agenda. It will actually be inserted. It will be order number 17-092. Um, it, the title of it is um, an act to create an ad hoc committee to review establish local rules and procedures for the ad administration of municipal elections and referendum votes. That item I'm asking actually to be inserted even though it's item 17-092 will be inserted before 17-090 and after eight, um, 089 which is toward, under new business. It will come before the discussion regarding the recertification of ballots. And what I will do is um, I will read when it comes up, I will read the entire um, act uh, and give it to the councillors then so that we stay focused on the rest of our agenda tonight. I have already signed our treasurer's warrants. Um, we already took care of item number 17-82, which is the executive session. So we'll move into order number 17-015, which is a seven o'clock public hearing and schedule a second reading on the six month moratorium on retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs. What I would like to do before public comment is actually turn it over to the ordinance chair for any um, comments, um, executive summary, refresher comments, and then we'll open it to public comment. This is a, member, uh, a matter that was before us quite some time ago. Uh, we passed in the winter or spring uh, at first reading a vote uh, on this moratorium. The moratorium is intended to uh, uh, place a prohibition on the retail sales or social clubs uh, selling uh, marijuana. Uh, and the reason that we're doing this is that we are waiting for the state uh, to issue uh, regulations and give us a framework for our own uh, uh, ordinance structure. Uh, those uh, regulations are due out uh, in uh, the spring of next year, 2018. Uh, Scarborough voted against the legalization of recreational marijuana uh, and the input I received is there is no rush to move this thing forward until we have a very clear idea what the state's going to do for a regulatory structure at which point we'll be able to deal with, uh, with our issues here at the local level. Uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to public comment. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Not seeing any, I'm gonna close public comment. Is there a motion uh, from council? So moved. Second. And just for the record, um, the second reading will be September 20th, 2017. Is there any comment from council? Questions? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Moving on to order number 17-083 is move approval 
on the request for a food handler's license and a special amusement permit. Um, I'm sorry, actually it's a public hearing and the action on the food handler's license and special permit for the Loyal Order of the Moose located at 19 Spring Street. Any comments from the town clerk? Actually, this is um, <coughs> for you because the applicant did not meet the required deadline to file a renewal. So therefore, it's um, and the next item is also the same. The two applicants did not file in a timely manner. And the way the ordinance reads, they have to go back before public hearing and action. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Not seeing any. Um, is there a motion for council? Move. Second. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Councilor Chiazzo. Um, could I ask the, the clerk if I could, um, was it just a, uh, it wasn't an, any kind of uh, violation issue or anything, it was just a time issue, right? Correct. They, okay. they did not uh, reapply in a timely manner. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. Moving on to order number 17-084. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to vote. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, and so the, um, oh, I just threw away. Well, uh, what is the... It's, uh, it's to approve order. just the action, right? It's Sorry about that. I, I actually threw the order behind me because I'm trying to get too much it's paper. Right is there a motion from council? Yes, so the motion. motion. There is a motion. All in favor? Sorry, I lost track. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 17084, 7 o'clock public hearing and action on the request for a food handler's license from Village Tie-Up Market in Delhi, LLC, doing business as New Higgins Beach Market, LLC, located at 82 Spurwink Road. <coughs> and DJIJR Inc. doing business as Salty Bay Seafood located at 68 Jones Creek Drive. Is there any comment from the clerk? I think you covered that at the last that this was a timing mm -hmm. filing issue. Any uh, comments from the public? Not seeing any, I'll accept a motion from council. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? Yeah. Not seeing any, all in favor? Thank you very much. Order number 17-055 is a second reading on the proposed Fourth Amendment to Contract Zone I, Frank R. Goodwin, E, e and F Limited Liability Company, and Raymond C. Field Land Rover Dealership located at 371 U.S. Route 1. I'd like to turn this over to the manager and the planning department for an overview before public comment. Yes, you may recall this applicant was before this council about six months ago, obtained a contract zone amendment at the time. Uh, there's been some further modifications um, to that plan such that um, uh, an additional amendment is required. This matter was heard before this council, been referred to planning board, and is now back before you for your final consideration. Uh, the applicant is here tonight if it pleases the council to have any presentation. Uh, <coughs> by staff's uh, estimation, um, the requested amendments are, are, are fairly straightforward and really in keeping with uh, the last amendment you approved, but they're certainly slightly different. I believe you also have copies of the planning board minutes uh, available, so you can see how they have weighed in and commented uh, on this proposed change. Great. Um, just for a high level, if I understand, in the, fir in the, last, par uh, the last paragraph on page one from Sebago Technics, um, is that the primary changes? It says that the request would be the fourth amended contract zoning agreement currently in force um, allows the building to be 14,730 square feet and 115 parking spaces. The new request increases the building space to 16,500 with no change in the overall number of parking spaces. And Jess, that's pretty much covers I, it all. I believe it's entirely the okay. square footage uh, increase is what's before you. Great. Um, any comments from the public? Not seeing any. A motion from council? So moved. Second. Um, any questions or comments for staff or for uh, the rest of us? Wonderful. Um, not seeing any. Um, moving the question. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-065 is a second reading on the proposed amendments to the Higgins Beach character-based zoning districts. Uh, before public comment, I'd like to turn this over to uh, the manager and sure. planning staff. Sure, I'll start and Jay Chase will take the podium. Um, this has become quite a complicated uh, document at this point. Um, Jay has done a great job to try to field questions from counselors, from members of the public. And what that means is that we, uh, where we find ourselves tonight is I have yet a new version of this uh, character code set of changes that reflect 
some additional changes that staff is recommending uh, to accommodate many of the uh, much of the input that's been received in the intervening weeks. Uh, so Jay did provide a copy of uh, a memo to you that provided a bit of a high level overview that captures those additional changes that are being sought. Um, and again, I do have drafts that uh, I can distribute at the appropriate time. I believe what would be in order, I think, to be most efficient is for uh, a motion to move uh, this document that I'm handing out tonight in front of you and you can consider it um, as a complete set of changes. Uh, so with that and the council's permission, uh, the town planner can provide you an overview. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Councilors, and I thank Tom for doing an excellent job of providing an overview and how he said this has become a complex document. I'd say it started as a complex document and we continue, we continue there, but I think uh, it's, as we talked about uh, at first reading, um, you know, there's, uh, when this was adopted in 2015, we talked about doing an audit process because this is a very different type of zoning context than we have in town. And so that's what this process was. Began with our long range planning committee back in March. Had a series of uh, public dialogues, including an open house at the Higgins Beach uh, Clubhouse back in June that have gone on through the summer and result in the document that is being handed out to you tonight. Um, again, where we've had a couple of discussions here at the council level and number of discussions, uh, other public discussions. I'll really just focus on sort of the changes that you're receiving tonight. And as uh, 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 town manager noted, the changes are really spelled out in the September 1st memo that uh, were provided to you. And really the bulk of the changes are in the, uh, around the non-conforming use and structures on page 53. Um, really seeking to ensure what we really intended to do here was to ensure that any structures that were made non-conforming uh, for the new setbacks were able to um, particularly to the rear setbacks and maximum front setbacks, we're able to put on additions that would otherwise be conforming, um, but for the maximum front setback. So there's some language, uh, new language proposed under section A, subsection I, that speaks to that. There's some other more modest changes that were uh, also proposed, just adding the word additions before components in some of the other subsections. There is a new piece of language that wasn't captured in the September 1st memo that I want to bring to your attention and it's in your packet. It's under, uh, say, um, under page 53, the non-conforming uses. It's under subsection F, which speaks to non-conforming eave heights. There's now a section F, subsection I, uh, which speaks to allowing, really both these sections are aimed at um, enabling um, existing structures to tie in, or additions, I should say, to tie into existing structures um, without certain limitations around eave heights. One of the big components were, were, that was addressed as part of this process was really trying to get at height and massing. You remember that from our earlier discussion. And really trying to reduce eave heights was identified as one of the <coughs> principal ways of doing that. However, as we start to play with the language and um, note that for various reasons, there might be structures that currently have an eave height that exceeds what's being proposed and tying in may be difficult, so enabling that connection to happen. Conversely, there might be uh, structures that have uh, ceilings that don't meet current ceiling standards. Right now, you need to have a ceiling that's at least seven feet high to be co-compliant. Long ago, you didn't need to meet that standard, so if you have a lower first floor ceiling, you may need to provide a step or steps between your two second stories to make them match and trying to tie eave heights in can be difficult. Um, and I can, some of you may not know what an eave height is, and if you wish, I can go into that, but I'll wait for a question before I do that. Um, so it is very technical in nature, and hopefully I'm, I'm giving you enough <laughs> to chew on, and as I said, happy to answer other questions. Um, another component uh, that we have uh, addressed in our memo has to do with uh, encroachments that are allowed for porches. Um, really enabling some more flexibility, particularly in the front and rear yards for porches to be established. Um, and then there are just some other really administrative changes. Uh, note on, um, let's see, what page is it? Page 18, really the, the requirement for fire rating 
The current code talks about the requirement for a 15-foot uh, setback or else you need to meet fire rating, which is really a higher uh, building standard and a lot more costly, quite frankly, um, where that standard actually doesn't kick in unless you're five feet or less from a property line. Um, and we think that was just really an administrative error at the initial outset that we'd like to correct now. Um, also, I will note under on the last page, last item of, of the uh, September 1st memo, Article 4E15, I stated that was page 15. That's actually page 45, sorry about that. Um, this is, again, sort of in that administrative realm. There's an additional 100 feet was the requirement. That struck through. 98 is the proposed requirement. We just failed to underline 98. Very administrative, but we want to be sure we bring all these items to your attention. Um, so as I said, and as the uh, town manager said, you have a new packet before you dated today. Um, the new items are in red, a bolder red. I know there's sort of the Higgins red is in there <laughs> that does some of the headers. Um, so hopefully that my explanation was clear and you, what you have before you is clear as well. I'm happy to answer any <coughs> questions. Um, before we get into questions from the council, I'd like to turn, uh, open it up to uh, public comment. Is there anybody here that would like to speak on the item? You're welcome just to come to the podium. You have three minutes. I, I do want to mention we tend to get a lot of uh, lengthy comments on this. If you do have them prepared, um, if we can receive a copy of them, we'd be happy to include them, one, distribute them amongst councils, but also include them into our minutes so that they are recorded as well. Thank you. Yep. I'm Allison Bristol. I'm not fully prepared. I don't have fully prepared comments tonight, so I'm going to stumble through this a little bit because zoning is not my area of expertise. But first of all, I want to congratulate the council on the school board vote, which is terrific. So I just wanted to share that. Um, in July, I appeared before the council to um, talk about my concerns with the uh, permitted uses for the mixed use limited in the Higgins Beach Character Code and uh, among other things asked that the permitted uses be revised uh, to um, be limited to residential or existing uses. And I shared this information with Jay and the um, planning committee and, and uh, um, received an email uh, middle of August um, saying that, you know, with the site plan review language that Councillor Donovan and Dan Bacon um, inserted in the 2015 version of the Higgins Beach Character Code that they really felt that the, uh, there were enough safeguards in place for abutting properties and that the intent is to balance the interests of all parties while seeking to maintain the character of the neighborhood and that that, that had been satisfied. So um, I am respectfully disagreeing with that opinion and appealing to the town council with my concerns and uh, some of it is based on um, how limited mixed use has been defined in that um, the four mixed use limited properties in Higgins Beach are the Higgins Beach Market, the Higgins Beach Inn, the Breakers, and the Higgins Beach Clubhouse. And so what is defined for all of them as permitted uses are the individual uses that they currently have. So it's all been lumped into one definition, but by virtue of the code, any of these properties can become any of these things. So I happen to live next door to the Breakers and a retail establishment under the current Higgins Beach Code could be established next door to me. And I would also say from a proximity standpoint, um, with the setbacks, my bedroom window could be 13 feet from an outdoor restaurant or from an ice cream shop in the middle of the summer, whereas the other properties either have a one or two lane road that separate them from abutters, with the exception of the undeveloped portion of the Higgins Beach Clubhouse, the grassy area of the clubhouse, there is a residential property on the other side of it that, that abuts the full property, but other than that, it's all either a one lane or a two lane road that separates the abutters from those properties. So um, in going through the zoning, one of the things that, that um, came to my attention, I see my time is up, um, the, is that uh, an alternative might be to, to 
with the exception of existing or residential uses, to uh, make any other use subject to a Board of Appeals review for a special exceptions permit, which pretty much guarantees that a permit has to be granted if certain um, standards are met. Um, that might be one way to approach it if we were trying to expand the permitted uses for those commercial properties. And the other thing I'll mention quickly, and I wanted to, I will email this to you, is um, pointing out in uh, Article 5, uh, Number 2, Letter H, that there is a uh, language that says, when a non-conforming structure is damaged or destroyed to the extent of 50% or more of its replacement value, the structure may be repaired or rebuilt only if it conforms to the provisions of the ordinance. And this is inconsistent with um, the code for the uh, zoning ordinance and also in the shoreland overlay ordinance where uh, the, the um, uh, property can be replaced or restored within a year. There's no, there's no percentage that's associated with it. And in my case, I have a one and a half story cottage that I inherited from a two generation Higgins Beach resident and I went to great care in 2009 to basically restore this cottage. And um, you know, there are things like the required porch that I wouldn't want to have to put on it. It would change the look, it would, it would um, uh, you know, ruin my water views to some extent. So I'm suggesting here that perhaps the council or the zoning committee might consider um, making that language consistent with the rest of the zoning code. And I'll email you the detail. And thank thank you, you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. And is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. So, any comments or questions from Council? Councilor Chiazzo. Um, I if I could, through the chair to the town planner, uh, could you address the uh, question I think that came up about uh, grandfathered status or, or what exceptions might be, I don't want to say made, but, but who's grandfathered and how that process takes place? Um, so are we talking about the use or so, so the, sort of her two comments in yeah. there and the way, um, and I, I recall Ms. Bristol's original email, the concern had to do with a change of use of existing commercial businesses from one activity to another activity. And um, as was indicated, the feeling is that the language that was drafted in 2015 states that any change of use, so if you currently have a, a bed and breakfast, it could change to a retail use, but it would require full site plan review by the planning board. So it's not as though you, even if they didn't make any structural changes, that change of use from one activity to another activity would require plan and board review. If it's just a bed and breakfast, one owner and a new owner taking over the bed and breakfast, same activity, no changes. But uh, actually, I, I wasn't referring to the to the okay. mixed use. I was more referring to you know existing projects that are in place now. When permitting was pulled, that kind of stuff. What when when would this code go into effect, and when does it start applying to people? Sure. Um, so presumably, my understanding is once the council makes their decision, um, it, barring any additional language, it would become effective this evening or tomorrow morning, I guess, when we walk in the office. Um, but I think the question also has to do with sort of any pending applications. Um, and and um, the way the law works on that is if we've received a complete application, and have begun with a substantive review. Essentially, once our code officers break the binder open, that starts the substantive review. Those applications then have standing under existing code. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions from council? So council if Ron. I can follow up on that, are, are, there, are there applications that have been submitted that haven't been opened yet? Is that? Uh, no, I actually was talking with our zoning administrator earlier today. We actually received an application today when I went in to talk to him. One of the code officers was walking, up, walking away from his desk with it. So um, I believe all the applications have, have standing. Great, thank you. And then Go ahead. I have a second question. Uh, could you address um, Mr. Bristol's second concern about the replacement? Um, I can do my best. I would like to pull up the language here. That, that one is, mm. might require a little more. And that was under H5H2. 
damaged or destroyed to the extent Okay, so yeah, essentially um, item number one does say, you know, when you if you have a structure that's damaged beyond 50%, then the expectation is any rebuild is consistent with the with the code. I would have to look more closely at how this is consistent or inconsistent with our shoreland zoning. Um, I, off the top of my head, uh, it's uh, not one I'm prepared to speak to Thank at you. this point. Any other questions, Councilor Foley? Um, so I would just follow up with, so it is a complex mm -hmm. uh, document, uh, but there would be nothing to preclude us if you did find down the road that there was some inconsistency in addressing it at some point in the future, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we could always look at it again uh, if that were the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions, sir? Councilor Sinclair? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit uncomfortable by the fact that there seems to be numerous residents that are concerned by some of the changes. I mean, we got an email today. I, I we've been told it's been addressed. I'm assuming that's the case. Um, but I'm I don't know if those are the only ones. Is it in regards to the the grandfather issue? Um, and they were asking if it was possible for us to delay the effective start date of this. Um, so that people that had things that were going on would be able to continue that project. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, a possibility or, or not, but um, I'm just a little bit, I, I, I do have a couple of concerns. It's a big, it's, it's a lot. Um, and it's asking a lot of people to conform a lot of things. Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, that's it for me. Can I ask? I'd like to ask a clarifying question from the council's comment to the planning. Um, did I hear? But you said that there are no pending projects that would be negatively impacted because they've already gone through the system. Well, they're they're under review, so they have vested rights, vested yep. interests. Okay. So so they would be reviewed under current code. Current code meaning what's okay. if you yeah. don't if you make no. What's that? Yes. yes. Right. Correct. Yeah. So are there any that, um, how many are not grandfathered that are in the process right now? None that we have received. What people may be working on, getting okay. ready to submit, I, I obviously can't speak to. Right. That clarifies <laughs> the question. Yeah. Nope. They're the ones negatively impacted by the counselors, based on the counselor's mm -hmm. statement, so that's why I needed to clarify. Thank you. Any other comments? Counselors? I'm not seeing any, and I'm going to call the question. All in favor of uh, order number 17-066. And that is six, all opposed to one. Thank you. I would move approval of, oh, sorry, I, I actually meant to just for clarity, that was actually 17065. I said 17066. I apologize. Just for clarity. The next item is the second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Town Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section I get my 12, Sign Regulations. I'd like to turn that over to the Ordinance Committee Chairman uh, for an overview before public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Ordinance Committee uh, really did benefit from the input uh, it received. Uh, it has been working on the uh, sign ordinance for probably five, six months. Uh, <coughs> we had very good input, I thought, in the comments that were made by town council members, uh, by the planning board uh, at the public hearing. There was a public hearing at the planning board as well as a very active discussion by planning board members. Uh, <coughs> uh, the public's comments at the town council public hearing were uh, uh, thoughtful uh, and brought to light a whole series of things that resulted in the Ordinance Committee holding a uh, further public hearing uh, or was publicly noticed 
uh, hearing in which we went over each and every uh, one of these proposed or challenged uh, changes uh, and, uh, and uh, voted unanimously to present the, the package that is before you today. Uh, the intention is to present a series of amendments that um, uh, reduce or minimize the impact of the ordinance because we had a number of comments that were related to First Amendment rights or uh, maybe the uh, list of uh, uh, environmental and ecological and scenic views was too extensive. So we went through in some great detail as a ordinance committee uh, in, uh, in trying to get that right uh, and be responsive. <clears throat> the, uh, the specific changes uh, beyond the content neutral <clears throat> changes which we have talked about uh, uh, and the uh, amendments there are extensive uh, were to uh, section J primarily uh, and the uh, 50 foot setback from eight high accident intersections was reduced to 30 feet and this was to match up with the state law that spaces signs uh, 30 feet apart and the state has gone through the same uh, <clears throat> content neutral process that we did uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, achieve their, uh, their compliance. Councillor Donovan, just if, if yes. I could, I'm just going to uh, pass out. I just wanted to mention this. Uh, yes. Councillor Donovan is, is going through the seven or eight different amendments that the yes. Ordinance Committee is bringing forward. I have a packet <coughs> that reflects all of those. Uh, there was a memo in the packet that gave a quick highlight uh, of each of them, but this is the actual text changes. So I just wanted to distribute it in the event you wanted to follow along. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, also in Section J, <coughs> uh, we reviewed each and every scenic view, uh, cut it back to the greatest extent possible unless it had uh, uh, an important environmental issue to combine with a scenic view. Uh, we generally uh, uh, eliminated or cut it back. <coughs> uh, the, in Section J1, the time limit for temporary signs in the right of way was increased from three to six weeks to match up with state law uh, and to recognize the typical length of time that election signs are up. And we looked at most of these, sec uh, these changes as trying to look at what was the circumstance that was the outlier. Uh, uh, one of these changes was uh, uh, to uh, Section J2, uh, uh, J1, excuse me, uh, in which uh, the time the temporary signs in the right of way needed to be removed before reposting had been in the prior draft six weeks. Well, somebody brought to our attention that uh, you could have a referendum. Uh, school referendum vote every four or five weeks and therefore we needed to reduce it. So we reduced it down to a week uh, so as to still have them removed for all those myriad of circumstances where they should be removed. They are temporary signs but we wanted to make sure that we were not encroaching on any particular circumstance like the referendum votes. Uh, uh, we uh, changed the spacing between same signs and we have eliminated the similar sign reference. That condition is still in state law, uh, but uh, uh, the comments that we received as an ordinance committee was that it could create confusion. Uh, we did not think that it was uh, necessary or appropriate to tackle the difficult definition aspect of that. And so we just said what we're limiting is the spacing of same signs to uh, match up with state law, which is every 30 feet. So again, we're, we're just matching with uh, state law. Uh, a 30-day removal period has been added to the private property uh, temporary sign section uh, so as to reduce the restrictiveness of the six-month limitation. Uh, in other words, the sign can go right back up after, uh, after 30 days. Uh, there was uh, something which the town planning director identified, which was 
uh, that electronic signs uh, 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 needed an amendment. This is a just a relatively uh, minor amendment. Uh, that is in there, and we have included in the order the um, uh, uh, political sign ordinance is repealed, which hadn't been in the first first reading. So I think that uh, the, uh, we had some comments that we did not uh, adopt. One was that changes are substantial and we should delay things. We've been reviewing this as a town council and as an ordinance committee and the public for months and months. Uh, the changes that we have made are all an effort to reduce the impact, not expand the impact. And so the argument that this is significant changes, I don't think really passes muster. So uh, we don't think that, that we didn't uh, consider it appropriate to uh, put that forward. Uh, telephone numbers was questioned that maybe email addresses were appropriate. Uh, uh, we found that telephone numbers are an effective way to promote uh, compliance and enforcement. Uh, and thus uh, the reason why at the ordinance committee level we included uh, phone numbers. So those are the most of the issues that were brought up uh, and how we dealt with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, I'd like to open it up for public comment. Is there anybody that would like to get up and speak? There are multiple speakers who are welcome to actually get in line to make this go a little smoother. You might want to bring the uh, microphone down just in yes, case. <laughs> Jean Marie Katarina, 311 Gorm Road. Uh, I'd like to thank the Ordinance Committee for uh, taking into consideration. Uh, I was one of the people who had a lot of uh, concerns um, as a real estate broker, was where I was coming from with a number of them. But I did come up with a couple of others I just have a question about. I'm going to bring up one is open house signs. Uh, open house signs, you know, we put them up for the time of the open house and take them down right after, at least I do. Not everyone does, but they should. Um, and what about if we're having an open house in a restricted area in one of these so-called restricted areas? That's just a question. Uh, and then my, I still have an issue with the six-month limitation on so-called temporary signs on private property. Uh, again, you know, depending on the real estate market or, you know, it could be a commercial real estate property. Um, very often commercial properties take more than six months to sell. So what are we supposed to do? Take down the sign and have it put back up again the next day? Uh, it costs money for us to post the signs. Uh, not a lot of money, but it is a cost uh, to folks to do that. Uh, and then this could be, it's just a legal question, and one is under your definition of short period of time, under temporary signs, you don't define short period of time. But my guess is that the fallback on that is you better refer back up, excuse me, to the body of the ordinance. But those were my only comments on this. But other than that, uh, you guys, from what I've heard, I haven't seen them, but um, the changes sound good to me. Thanks. Benjamin Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I've spoken uh, numerous times. Uh, and I was happy to hear that there has been some changes to Section J of this ordinance. Um, I don't have exactly what they are, so please uh, take my comments tonight with a grain of salt. Um, again, um, as I've argued before with previous court cases, um, the aesthetic appeal and for safety purposes, uh, the judge's comments were, we see plenty of things in our lives that displease us and to just move your eyes. Um, but beyond that, as I've tackled that numerous times, I'd like to just uh, go into the traffic data that I have attained from the chief um, at two of the intersections. Uh, it would have done more, but it is a time-consuming process for them to grab this and give that to me, and I think they have better things to do with their time um, than that. But at the Payne Road intersection, um, my analysis was based off of the current ordinance on signs, which is 20 days that they could be up, uh, what I found. Um, so based off of the peak season for temporary signs, which is before an election, um, which is the first Tuesday of each November, I did a calculation. 
um, over the three-year time period from uh, 7, 2014 to 2017, um, there was only, uh, sorry, there was only six accidents um, in October at the Payne Road and Route 1 intersection. Uh, that was not the peak of the year. The peak of the year was at 14 in June. Uh, there was nine in July and 10 in August. Um, again, I then did an analysis for one other place because there was no statistical evidence that suggested that these temporary signs caused increased accidents at these tra traffic intersections. I have the traffic data for the Gorham Black Point intersection. Again, the data is very similar with a peak in um, sorry, May of 14, August was 11, and July, or sorry, June was 11, July was 10, August was 9, and in fact, October and November, when these signs are normally at their peak, there was only four accidents. Um, interestingly enough, both these had a very similar pattern where traffic accidents were normally down in the months of October, November, December, where they would then increase again uh, in stormy weather. Again, I didn't do an analysis to determine if the weather was a cause, but they increased in January, um, January, February, and March. April, they decreased, and then around tourist season, they, they bumped back up again to those numbers uh, that I said. Um, based off this data, there is no evidence that these signs uh, cause accidents, and therefore we should definitely look into removing uh, this from the ordinance as it is um, something someone could challenge us on in court. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Larry Hartwell, Nine Period and Drive. Um, hearing the synopsis, it sounds good. There's certainly been major changes made since uh, day one, um, and that's good. Um, in the board package last Friday, there was just a memo, and the actual changes were not in there. And it w appears tonight that the council is just actually getting handouts at this point in time. So that would be my one point of c criticism. Um, yes, I'm very pleased with the changes, listening to the public. Um, I think we've got something that's that's workable and reasonable, and, and certainly I appreciate the uh, ordinance committee taking the comments to heart and uh, coming up with a, a better plan. Thank you. Any other public comments? Nobody in the hallway, right? Any other comments? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment and is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Comments and questions? Council Chiazzo. So um, I did attend the last ordinance meeting where this was discussed and I, I do want to compliment the ordinance committee on their um, yeoman-like approach to this and their due diligence with going through all the issues. It was, uh, it, it was a lot of uh, weeding through a lot of stuff. Um, a, a couple of things that I appreciate and why I will support this. Um, it does reduce the impact on the ecological areas. I think that was a prime concern that we had initially going into this ordinance. Um, more to my own personal benefit, I should say, uh, political signs can still, if I understand, be on private property for up to six months continuously. So when the campaign season kicks off, they can be on people's lawns for, I, I hope it's going to be uh, not six months, but you know, <laughs> they have the duration of the, the, from the time they, uh, for campaigning purposes. And they're only restricted in the right of way for three weeks. So I think that's important. I don't think that limits speech because you can still put signs in your own property for as long as you want. Uh, I just think that helps reduce maybe some of the clutter and the, the um, appearances in town. Um, I like the fact that it, it aligns more with state enforcement. I think that's going to be our state requirements. I think that's eas easier to enforce. So we don't have two sets of rules we have to work with. And last but not least, this isn't set in stone. You know, if we try it for an election cycle, we see how it works, we see what the response is, and it can be tweaked. I think it's a good step uh, in the right direction. I think it, it, there was a, uh, uh, a public request uh, based on the last cycle, last election cycle, I should say, for adjustments, and I think uh, I compliment the Ordinance Committee for the work that they've done. Any other comments, Councillor Foley? Um, so there's 
majoritively the things in here. I, I like the intent. I appreciate the effort. I, I was witness to a lot of those conversations, and it was um, thoughtfully done, for sure. Uh, I do feel like it still goes a little too far for my comfort level. Um, I love the alignment uh, with the state. I think that's a good piece. But in terms of the, I guess I, I'm looking at it also from the enforcement uh, aspect of it. I, I just feel like, um, you know, all of these, uh, who's going to know all these different scenic vistas? I, I, the ecologically sensitive areas, I completely agree with. If it's just a matter of I don't want to look at these ugly signs, then I have to disagree that we have the, uh, the right or ability to be um, legislating in that way. So, because I can't pick it apart and support the things that I like and not, um, I'm not going to support this tonight. Uh, but that's not to say that I, I don't appreciate the work that the Ordinance Committee did and the intent behind it. I, I know your hearts were in the right place and trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there has been a, a few speakers said some things tonight that I also agree with, um, so I can't support it as a whole. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just to piggyback, I mean, I, I think first of all, just kind of in the conversations we've had um, around transparency and making sure everybody understands, I did pick up on the three speakers that did speak tonight saying that this is similar to our prior conversations, really a complex document. There have been a lot of changes. Um, I've had several emails and folks saying they really didn't see the level of detail. So my preference would be to have people be able to digest what's in here and come back and have a conversation if we're not willing to do that tonight. I, I absolutely agree that we have to do this to be in compliance with law and other things, but I think there are some, some real balancing acts and some overreach. I do support because we did have specific complaints around Route 1 along the marsh. That, you know, prohibition I, I agree with don't necessarily agree with restrictions on other areas, and, and I certainly don't agree with the restrictions around the intersections. I, I you know, I, as was pointed out to us, there's really no evidence that there's a safety issue here. If there is a safety issue, there's other ways that those, those signs can be removed. So similarly, at this point, where it is and how this has developed, I won't be supporting this tonight yet. The comments, <coughs> Councilor Rowan. Yeah, so I really think that there were, um, and I just want to go go back through kind of why we were doing this. Um, uh, first and foremost, it was to align uh, with the Supreme Court decision that our sign ordinance had to be content neutral. Um, and so uh, the way that our sign ordinance reads right now, it's not. Um, and we have two uh, components of that. One is we have a political sign ordinance, which is clearly not content neutral because it <laughs> refers to political speech. Um, and so later in the agenda, we're going to be um, have that to be repealed um, as a first read. Um, but there, there are a lot of changes here that really uh, attempt to comply with the law. Um, the second was to address the uh, ecological concerns. And really, it came down to uh, all of the, the sections of road listed are um, where the, the road borders the marsh. It's really Route 1, Black Point Road, Pine Point Road. And we really tried to cut it down because there was um, some really good points made about the fact that there, there uh, initially, we had sections of the road that we were restricting signs that uh, were not bordering the marsh, and so this really was cut down. Um, we did use road intersections um, so that it would be very clear about where this applies and where it doesn't. Um, I completely take the point of there are eight or you know nine or ten of these things, and like no one's going to nobody's really going to measure uh, memorize that. But um, when you're on these roads, it's pretty obvious where the marsh is and where the marsh isn't. Um, the, um, the third point was around public safety, um, and I really think that um, I really couldn't find any, um, uh, any analysis that suggested um, that either this, that the political science had any impact on um, the accidents in the intersection uh, one way or the other, um, but these are our, our eight most accident-prone intersections in town. Um, they're, you know, distracted driving is a problem. Um, the, the thought being that let's err on the side of public safety. This came from the uh, police chief, um, and uh, I think it makes sense to, to try it. Um, the, and then the fourth thing was around the sign proliferation. And if you recall, we came up, we, we, at first read, we came to you with 528 feet in between um, similar signs. Um, and I think that really came from uh, uh, concern around the aesthetics of the sign proliferation and, and um, uh, in the ordinance committee, we decided to pull that back to the 
uh, what the state has uh, put forth in their recommendation, which was 30 feet apart on the signs. Um, so I felt like that was a good, um, a good compromise because now we're aligned with the state and it's not just three people or seven people's uh, aesthetic appeal. Um, so, um, and then we also decided that since we were using 30 feet, it would be a good idea to use that in terms of the distance from the intersection as well. Um, so we reduce the 50 feet to 30 feet, and then we have one unit of measure. Um, um, in terms of, so realistically, the only impingement on free speech that we, that we potentially have is around those eight intersections to say that you can't have a sign in the intersection because 31 feet away from the intersection, you, you can put your sign. Um, um, so I feel like it's a it's a good compromise. I feel like everything that we've done is is defensible, and I feel like it it should move forward and should be supported. And so I will. Other comments? I think I'm the only one who hasn't spoken. Um, so I am going to pick this apart a little bit. Um, so first, um, I do just a couple of minor corrections on page um, three. Uh, at the top, there is a uh, incorrect spelling of the word authorized. If that could be corrected, it's minor. I'm not going to make that into a tape, uh, into a motion. Um, the second is that there are really five concerns that I looked at uh, that came out of um, co um, citizen comments that I received this past year. Um, those issues were the height of the signs, and I'm talking mostly about temporary signs, the size of the signs, the breadth or the uh, density of signs, um, signs on private property, and then this issue of intersections and public safety and um, other kind of concerns that kind of uh, drive around that. I was wondering, I know that we had this conversation, but if you can refresh my memory, did the ordinance committee address the issue of height and how did they um, kind of um, mm -hmm. balance that in their recommendation? Because it's not specifically mentioned. Uh, and I think we uh, talked about it in terms of uh, signs in the right of way are limited to six square feet. Uh, and therefore, uh, they are in almost all cases uh, signs two by three which is the typical sign you see on wires, a wire frame. Uh, and that, that we deem to be the most appropriate way to uh, restrict the, the mass of the sign, the height uh, and, and the square footage is by using a, a six square foot measurement. Okay. Um, but that doesn't necessarily prevent someone from erecting a six square foot sign 10 feet in the air. No. Um, which the question, the concern that was stressed is that is that truly a temporary sign because the structure needed to do that becomes more almost permanent because you'd have to dig pretty deep to be able to have the supporting structure to support that. So um, I'm not going to get tied up on that particular issue because I think there's a couple of other things that I would like to recommend. The first is that in the form of a motion amendment, I would actually like to recommend, um, sorry, I've got to find the right page. On page 16, which is uh, a, a continuation from page 15, section J, um, this is the fourth paragraph that begins to read, and I'm not going to read the entire part because I only want to uh, change the first uh, seven words. It says, to, to protect public safety in and around intersections with high traffic volumes, no temporary signs, so forth, so on. I would actually move to amend that and delete to protect public safety in and around and simply put the word at. So it would read, at intersections with high traffic volumes, no temporary signs shall be placed in the right of way. And then it provides a detail for the remainder. And if there's a second, I'd be happy to explain why. Second. The reason is that while we try to be content neutral within the document, um, the statement is not content neutral because we, one, as it's been um, iterated to us, that there is no data whatsoever, including the data that was provided that suggests that signs are the cause of any accidents. Um, although I would mention that the data that was provided about accidents June, July, and August, um, at least for the last 10 years, they seem to be very heavy months in which we have referendum questions and a lot of political signs even then, but you still can't draw a correlation. I just would prefer the, not, the more neutral language by changing that to the word at, at intersections with high traffic volume. Why politically charge this or make it emotional by suggesting that this is about public safety, even though we can use it in our oral arguments? Yes. So I, I would just, uh, I, I guess, maybe counter that by saying that there were, if I recall, there were only certain uh, parameters in which you could restrict sign placement. Is that correct? And there were only certain criteria that you could use, one of which was public safety, mm -hmm. the other was econo 
ecologically sensitive areas, I believe. So I, I agree with the chairperson in terms of trying to make it content neutral. I'm just wondering if we do need to spell it out, the reasoning behind why we're, why we're allocating those areas and if that helps to convey the intent a little bit more. May I ask, uh, yeah. the, did the amendment, would you read the language the way you would have it amended? Sure. At intersections with high traffic volumes, no temporary signs shall be placed in the right of way within 30 feet of the following intersections as measured linearly from the point of tangent to the intersection or the point of tangent where a dedicated turn lane is provided, whichever is furthest from the intersection. So I'm changing literally the first seven words, which read, to protect public safety in and around, to, and inserting the word at. Yeah, we had uh, uh, the chief of police uh, appear before us and say he definitely thought that this would promote public safety. And so when people say, well, what, what did you base this on? We based it on the fact that the person charged with public safety in this community felt this was a very appropriate thing to do. Uh, and we selected just those that were the busiest, highest uh, uh, impact uh, intersections. And I think there's a certain self-evidence here when you think about distracted driving and uh, all that we've realized with people who are not paying attention to the road that with uh, uh, signs clogging up uh, the very point at which you enter the intersection, it seems pretty self-evident to me that this promotes public safety. Absolutely. Um, if there's no objection, I would like to withdraw my amendment or at least ask that it be changed. And instead of eliminating those first seven words, we simply change the word protect to promote. Second, that a motion to amend. Any other comments? Yes, Councilor Roy. I like it. I think it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes a big difference, but sure. Come on. Yeah, it's nice. Any other comments or questions on the amendment? Yes. Oh, no, nothing on the amendment. No. Okay. Um, all in favor of the amendment? Back to the main motion. Um, actually, in thinking, um, actually, the only thing I want to mention, um, I'm not a big fan of the, i got to find the right section. Oh, um, page 17 on the temporary signs on public use, public, private property. Um, I, I understand um, what you're getting at and why I can respect it. I live in a cul-de-sac um, community. Homeowners Association kind of manages that, and there's restrictions within that, so I can respect why, you know, neighborhoods should have that. At the same time, you know, my property is my property, and I have a right, uh, but I hope that as a good neighbor, um, we're all cognitive of the fact that this impacts our neighbors and that we might be better neighbors and not violate that because the fact is no matter what you put into writing common sense does not change common sense um, you know kind of takes the day on all of this and you really should think about it even with a two by three sign or a six foot square sign no matter where you place it you should be aware of who um, you know whose property that butts I've talked to business owners who get very upset because even though it's in the public right away, they don't want political signs in front of their business. And no matter what the party is, it's not about party, it's about hurting businesses. And I worked in a community in York County in which there were a lot of businesses that would put out signs. Please do not put signs here. We're neutral. And so that's kind of the society that we're getting into because some people just don't want to be civil and um, be thoughtful of what they're doing with these signs. So I think the changes are good. I think that you, know, you did a yeoman's work and a good job. So I appreciate the effort. Yes. If I could ask a question, uh, one thing I noted, or, and maybe I missed it in the body of this, um, we currently have a requirement to remove signs within a certain time frame after an, after an election, let's say. Is there anything in here that references removal and within a certain period? Was that, was that a conscious decision or was that something that was, that was I think it's in the omitted, accidentally omitted or something? Uh, so uh, the only way to do that would be to... Um, make a pass a judgment on the content of the sign to say that a political sign would have to be removed after an election that would be specifying the content of the sign right. so in order to keep it content neutral there's just a time limit um, I, I want I want would it and again I'm this may be a legal question could you just say if it's a sign in reference to an event then it has to be with removed within a certain number of days from the event whether it's a bean supper or <coughs> a open house or 
You, you know what I mean? Yeah, I suppose we probably. Yeah. Suppose my only concern, and, and my only concern yeah. is that you know, right, right as it stands right now, it's, it's sometimes difficult for us to enforce after, for political signs after an, an election when they have to come off, and there's usually a very large effort to meet a certain deadline. And I'm afraid if that's not there, there's no real onus or or requirement for people to remove those signs, and they may. They're, they are temporary, so they could stay up longer or they, there's no onus to really get them down in, in a timely manner. And I, I don't remember whether in the state adopting its new temporary sign ordinance, whether it continued to include a time period by which it needed to be removed. I think it does. I think it's and, two days. And, and, and the <coughs> assistant town manager and I looked at that and it was our recollection that it no longer exists. And, uh, and they may have been faced with the same problem of you can't make political signs be the only ones they get picked up. Uh, right, which is why I said, you know, perhaps after an event. If the open house is finished, mm -hmm. after the open house is done, you have two days to remove it. After the bean supper is completed, you have two days. And it doesn't have to be two days, just a period of time so that we can mm -hmm. make sure that whoever's responsible for putting the signs up mm -hmm. also removes them in a timely manner. I, I, and I, and I'll defer to the Ordinance Committee for whatever wording that mm. needs to be. I mean, I if there's a question for the Assistant Manager, she's here to, that can answer it. Yeah, I, I have no problem. You know, personally, I have no problem making that change. Would you like to get up and speak, Ms. Crockett? And if you can introduce yourself, I think it's the first time you've spoken at a public or at Very a exciting. meeting. Um, <laughs> Larissa Crockett, I'm your assistant town manager. Um, so I have seen examples of ordinance where they have language that is um, clearly not specific <coughs> to a specific type of sign, but I think that it would be, I think you could do so. I would think if I were Phil Saucier, I would say, um, I would encourage you to be cautious mm -hmm. because the intent of content neutral sign language is that whoever is either enforcing or authorizing the sign does not need to read it in any way in order to enforce it. And so if we were to say it needed to come down within a couple of days of the event, then that would require having read the sign. And so I think, and I have seen examples of, sign, of ordinance that has a, had a provision similar to that. If I were Phil Saucier, I feel strongly that I would say to the ordinance committee and to the council to the, be the most cautious and to put yourself in the least likelihood of challenge, I would not put that amendment in and just see how it works from there. But I think you, I think that because we have examples of other communities that have adopted ordinances that have similar language to what Councillor Chiazzo is suggesting, I think it can be done. I think the most cautious and um, protective choice would be to not. Does that answer your question? Mm, very good. Councillor Hayes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a motion that we, um, Remove all the under under we remove all language that has to do with the restrictions around the intersections. And I think the reason I say that I really pick up on something Council Rowland said. I think the perception does matter. Perception does matter in our community. And certainly since we've heard about a passion around First Amendment rights and the interpretation, I think you know if we can't make the stretch to public safety. Um, I, I think we should really think about that. I think we are, and I, and I think we've been cautioned several times that this may or may not be constitutional or not. So I, at least that would be my motion to consider at this point removing the restrictions around the intersections. I'll second. Comment. Oh, that, that was official motion, right? Yes. I'm accepting that as a motion, even though his dialogue came with it. But yes, Council Foley. I was going to second that, and then so uh, one of the comments I wanted to add that I didn't neglect to mention earlier around the, and I think if it, if we got rid of the intersection piece, I think I could totally support the rest of this, um, uh, even though I think maybe it's still going to be a little bit complex. But I, I think about something as simple as a garage sale. So is everybody who's going to hold a garage sale going to know uh, what the intersection sign is and? You know, are we setting up citizens to fail? In other words, are we setting them up into like, I'm going to go and break the law and I don't know I'm breaking the law because I feel most people don't want to break the law. They want to do the right thing. So I think the 30 feet for me takes care of it. Um, so I would support 
this motion or this amendment, and then I think that would also uh, put me in line to support the whole entire piece, if that makes sense. Council Piazzo. So I, I probably won't support the motion because we've heard testimony from staff, uh, public safety staff, saying that they do feel that that would be beneficial. Um, I trust that opinion, and again, the fact that it's temporary, I, I say we give it a try. We, we run through a, 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 a year or two, uh, like every ordinance that we, that we pass, it's not necessarily set in stone, and, and I would honor the input from public safety in town. Other comments? Not seeing any, all in favor of the amendment, I believe that is section J, <laughs> starting with I'm sorry, could I, could I make a, could sure. I make a comment? Yeah, so um, I struggle with, with this one. I think that um, um, my preference would probably be to err on the side of public safety, but on the other hand, what, with the 30-foot restriction now instead of, you know, eight signs that you can put up in the intersection or however many you can fit into the intersection, you're, you're limited to one, so we're at least getting some reduction there. Um, <coughs> Um, so I, I feel like um, I can see the the point of view around um, making sure that we're we're on solid footing with everything that we're doing with this. Um, so I guess my point is that I'm struggling. <laughs> While he uh, tackles no. that, anybody else? <laughs> well, I I just like to kind of I mean I think yes it's 30 feet, but you can still have four signs at intersection. It's just 30 feet, one in each direction. They're just not four or five crowded in the intersection right now. You can approach from every angle if it's a four-way intersection or an eight-way, eight corners, for example. As long as it's 30 feet from that intersection in any direction, you're fine. So you still have, you still have the ability to put a sign near the intersection, it's just not on the intersection. Councilor Foley. Um, so for me, this does one other thing that I didn't, neglected to mention was that it simplifies it a little bit more in terms of enforcement. And by that, I mean, I, all of us have been through elections. Um, we know that there are phone calls about signs. Uh, this purple and blue sign is uh, five feet too close to something else. And then I believe those get fielded through our town clerk, whom I personally believe has a lot better things to do with her time than to sort out like the, the kind of the pettiness around signs that sometimes comes and emerges through uh, election cycles, it's, it's going to still happen. I, I understand that, but I feel like just this one piece, we already have the 30 piece alignment, could help simplify that both for our PD and for our town clerk. Um, so that would be another argument that I would make in support of uh, this part of it. Councilor Owen. I just want to clarify the, my statement. If, if we were to remove the restriction around the not being in the intersection, because the side of the intersection is less than 30 feet away, you, you would really be limited to, I could only put, if I were running for office, I could only put one sign in that intersection, whereas today I might put one on each corner, not under this, but under our current ordinance, which doesn't limit, is what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is there wouldn't be a, it would still be an improvement if we were to do this, and we could always come back and add this, um, the, the eight intersections back in. Council Donovan. Yeah, I'll, I'll oppose it because it, it goes counter to the evidence we had from the chief. It is a public safety issue and it's so evident that distracted driving is the cause of severe traffic accidents. Uh, and so to uh, oppose something that is so obviously supporting public safety, I, I just can't do that. I can't oppose that. Any other comments? I have none, so with that, I am going to uh, move the amendment. So the amendment is to remove section J starting at paragraph four. That reads, um, as previously amended, that reads uh, to promote, okay, to promote, we changed it to promote last time, mm -hmm. to promote public safety in and around intersections all the way through the listing up to um, number one is, was uh, Councillor Hayes' amendment. Is there, um, with that, um, all in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, all opposed. One, two, three, four. And the motion fails. Back to the main motion as amended. Is there any other amendments or any other requests? 
Not seeing any. All in favor of the main motion as amended? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five. All opposed? One, two. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to order number 17-067 as a second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 601, Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance, section 25, Parking Regulations. And I'd like to turn it over to the Ordinance Committee Chair for a brief summary. Uh, these are um, uh, some changes to the parking on East Grand Avenue. The Police Department sponsored these uh, changes. They're relatively minor. They're really intended to correct locations of permitted parking. It really doesn't uh, take away any permitted parking. There are spaces that are dedicated to the businesses there, and these are clarified uh, uh, as well as the start and stop points for uh, allowed parking. Thank you. Uh, with that, any comments from the public? Not seeing any, we'll uh, entertain a motion. So move. Second. And uh, any council comments? Going once. Not seeing any, all in favor? Not unanimous, thank you. Order number 17-078 is an act on the request to submit the referendum question to construct and equip a new public safety building to the November 7, 2017 election. Uh, you skipped, uh, skipped, skipped oh, I'm sorry, I did it again. Horses. horses. I'm trying, yeah, gotta take up the horses. Gotta take up the horses, I apologies. Order number 17-068, second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 604A, Town of Scarborough Horse Beach Permit Ordinance, section 604A-6, regulation of horses on the beach. Um, and I'll turn that over to the Ordinance Committee Chair for a brief summary. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what's euphemistically called uh, uh, horse bun bags on Pine Point Beach. Uh, horses are allowed on Pine Point Beach in the off season. Uh, it, uh, when we had a more active uh, 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 raceway here, uh, they, it was a lot more permits. They're down substantially, but uh, still. Uh, an enjoyable sport for people who enjoy riding horses. Uh, we used to have this provision in our ordinance, but when we joined with Old Orchard Beach to try and consolidate and have uh, uh, consistent provisions between the two towns, uh, we eliminated it. Uh, almost all of the permits uh, that are now being granted these days are being granted to Scarborough residents. So uh, uh, going back to what we had before, Obviously, the effort here is to keep the beach clean. Uh, because of the size of uh, uh, horses, it's no easy feat for a rider to get on and off a horse uh, in the middle of the winter on Pine Point Beach. Uh, and therefore, this, uh, this provision seems appropriate to balance the interests of those who would like to see the beach stay clean and those who would like to be able to continue to ride on the beach. Thank you. With that, I'd like to open up public comment. Anybody that would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from Council? No move. Second. Any comments or questions from Council? Council Rowan. I, I just think this makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is an active fishery. This is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, we haven't heard from um, horse owners to, to say don't do this, and the horse owners that I have spoken to have said that fun bags are a thing that they um, uh, were, were either comfortable with or um, could support. So. Thank you. Any other comments? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous. I'm gonna be taking up a collection for new glasses at the end of the meeting today, by the way. <laughs> Order number 17-078 is an act on the request to submit the referendum question to construct and equip a new public safety building to the November 7th, 2017 election, tabled from the August 16th, 2017 town council meeting. I'd like to turn this over to the town manager for presentation before public comment. Yes, uh, this matter requires council action to place the bond question uh, before the voters on November 7th. Um, because of the fiscal aspects of this bond question, um, state law does require disclosure of certain financial information. We have worked with our financial advisor um, and come up with uh, very, we believe, accurate and, and as, as accurate as possible estimates of financing costs and, and the like. Uh, you'll also note that this um, this referendum question includes a couple of pieces to help draw down the overall cost of the building. 
um, those being the use of existing reserve funds that this council controls. Those funds incidentally have funded much of the work to date, hiring consultants and the like. It also contemplates the sale of the current facility and using proceeds from that sale toward the construction cost of the new facility. That is an issue. That is the issue that kind of hung uh, hung up the council at your last meeting, and perhaps it's best for Councilor Rowan to oh. speak to that matter when the appropriate time comes. Um, uh, beyond that, we have provided some additional support information regarding um, kind of all the different components of the referendum question. Just as a final reminder, if we wish to have this on, on the November ballot, a uh, decision must be made tonight uh, to allow adequate time. With that, I'd like to open up for public comment. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the comment? Mr. Freeman, thank you for staying so long. <laughs> I'm Kevin Freeman. I'm from uh, 2 Sterlingwood Drive off of Broad Turn Road. Um, I'm also the chair of the Ad Hoc uh, Public Safety Building Facilities, uh, Public Safety Facility Building Committee. Um, I urge your support uh, for the project here tonight. Uh, as you've heard from both the chiefs and uh, myself earlier, uh, we feel that we put together a solid plan. We'd like to put it in front of the voters to see if they agree with us. Um, you know, if that, that's the best way to, to find out if our plan is for sure uh, a good plan. Um, that being said, uh, we have, as you gave us the charge to stay together as a committee, uh, we've met once uh, since then, and we've been planning a public outreach program um, which will begin tomorrow evening uh, at the Black Point Fire Station. It's an educational session starts at 6.30 p.m. We're hoping that we're going to be able to say that it's on the ballot, and that's our first um, public outreach uh, before the election. So uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? And Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Uh, I just have a question. Um, is there anything in the works uh, regarding the uh, middle school? I know when I attended, they were still they had portables, and they're still using portables down there. Um, for me, uh, I think that may I think that should take precedence over uh, the current project at hand. Um, but maybe something is already in the works. I'm not aware of. If someone could answer that question um, at some point, that'd be great. Uh, for the public, as um, best of my understanding, and um, others may have a different knowledge, um, there is no formal long-range plan been presented to us or to the public by the school board. So while they are looking at the full school needs, nothing specific has been uh, delivered to us for consideration or for conversation. Yes. So I, I, I to partially agree, I, there is a plan in place, I think. I think they're deliberating at this point where the priorities are going to be, but I think they have a very good long-range facilities plan in terms of maintenance requirements, growth, that kind of stuff. It's a question of rolling it into our plan and, and bringing the two together. So I just want to make sure that, that it's understood. I think the work's in the process of being done and very close to being done. It's not like a plan just does not exist. The, there was also a meeting to which we were invited last spring, I believe, or which they presented a plan and mm -hmm. they talked, and the, the discussion at that point was that they were working on applications to put it through the state process for, for right. state funding. Right. Uh, for that in the primary schools, but they were still evaluating, you know, what what to do moving forward. And that yes. to your point, we've we've been given a um, we've been given a commitment by Superintendent Kuckenberger that they have will not be doing any major investments or any building at all for at least five years. So as well, you can tell by our responses, um, we're unclear <laughs> on what is actually being presented except for the fact that we do not have any formal plan or recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, if that is coming forward, we will know uh, when you know. So thank you for the question, though. Um, any other public comment? Uh, Judy Roy, 2nd uh, Avenue. Um, I certainly would uh, encourage you to please vote yes on this project. I happened to be sitting on the town council when we had our old town hall and we all walked to a table to look at some maps and the floor gave out underneath of us and it dropped a foot. 
So I've been there. I've struggled with, you know, getting the new building. And it took us, I think, two votes before to get the new town hall. And, um, and then, of course, the, the committee was established again, and we set it aside because of the recession. And so, you know, I think that those of us that have worked on the committee and worked for the project have been patient with the economy and everything else going, going around. But certainly the conditions in which the current public safety building is uh, leaves a lot to be desired and certainly I would encourage you. I, I serve on the ad hoc committee and I will continue to serve until the, the building is up and the door, um, door unlocked for the first day. So um, hopefully we can get there. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak? Not seeing any, I'm going to close the public comment. And is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Comments and questions? Council Rowan. Uh, so I, I appreciate the, um, uh, the the council's indulgence from the last meeting um, to the table, and I just want to provide the history for that and explain kind of where where I landed with that. Um, so if you recall, it, um, when this came up on, um, I believe it was the 16th of August, um, you heard um, uh, Carol Rancourt get up. Um, Carol is the um, chair of the 55-plus um, advisory uh, program advisory uh, committee um, and we had had a meeting um, the day before um, and it was just kind of our regular August meeting and at that meeting there was a, a discussion around um, <clears throat> a very strong desire for that committee um, or for that population um, to have a, um, a place where they could have regular meetings where they could have um, cookouts uh, excuse me uh, lunches um, and hold a, hold events, um, and um, um, so there was a consternation from them around uh, what the sale of the building and, and could there be another use to reuse that building uh, in order to um, um, to serve that need. Um, and so after the meeting, I had a, a lot of discussions with. Uh, so at at the meeting, uh, we heard Councilor St. Clair. We heard. Um, from uh, both the chief of police and, and the fire chief. Um, and uh, after the meeting, uh, I had an opportunity to have discussions with a couple members of the, the building committee. And kind of um, the concerns that uh, were expressed around that were, were um, really that the, the traffic uh, accessibility, it's really hard to turn in and out of there. Um, there is really only one large meeting area in that apparatus bay, um, and there's no air conditioning in there. Um, that apparatus bay is also drained um, with uh, via trench drains, um, which uh, are big, just kind of open strips that dip down, and they're covered with grating. Um, and so there's a real concern about, around uh, mobility concerns as well as um, for individuals using wheelchairs. Um, and they're also the bathroom facilities are not very convenient to that mm. to that space. Um, there are also very limited kitchen facilities in the. Um, uh, in that building that are also not convenient to that particular space or really um, any space, uh, as near as I can tell, or any large meeting space. Um, so there are really concerns around um, like ADA compliance in that building um, uh, as well as um, whether those bathroom, there are any bathrooms that are uh, accessible for individuals with a, a disability um, in the building at all. Um, the boiler is really on its last legs, um, and the maintenance to that building has much of it has been deferred and discontinued. Um, so heating and cooling the building would be very expensive. We're open to repairs, um, and so in totality, uh, you know, it really seemed to make it um, impractical to convert even on an interim basis that building. Um, and so um, uh, I expressed that those concerns to that committee, um, and it was really met with general disappointment but acceptance um, and um, I just want to read uh, one of the emails uh, in the exchange was with Carol um, and she really um, and I just wanted to reiterate it because I think it has just an Im or read it because I think it has an important message that just needs to be reiterated and she says um, I understand their point of view um, but I'm glad that we uh, raised our concern uh, to at least uh, a serious talking point um, she indicated that she would I will contact the town manager to discuss possible large space that the town can rent. Um, for seniors, the end of life is in their front window, not in the rearview mirror. Another five to ten years for the community center is too long for many of us, 
as we have been hoping since the 1990s for a place to call home or uh, for regular programs and meetings. Um, so, I, again, I appreciate the uh, indulgence, and I apologize for the inconvenience, but I think it was really sure. important to um, bring that segment of the population along with kind of the decision that was being made. Um, and I especially important because it was a single um, single action item where once the decision was made, it was, it was moving forward. Um, and then I have one other comment, which is that I have um, a couple of, or a, a daughter who, um, uh, shockingly is going to be in middle school in two years. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I have seen both the middle school and the public safety building, and I have to rate the public safety building. I think if, if anyone has um, any doubts about the, the need, I really encourage you to go in and take a tour um, because the, um, and I believe the chiefs would be more than happy to host uh, your tour because I think seeing is believing and uh, we're in desperate need of uh, replacing that building. So Thank you. I support this measure. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Hayes. Well, I, I, I was just going to mention two things. One, um, there's now a uh, video tour that's actually available. We have access to that now. Um, we'll get that to the council. You can distribute that to whoever you think um, would like to see that. But it kind of helps people that, you know, can't schedule the time or don't have the time to get in there. But there is, they did do a video tour that's pretty, really good. Um, and also, just to reiterate, um, we actually, we were the ones that approached um, the superintendent, and we were the ones that asked for five years, and she very willingly gave us the five years. Um, and probably if we'd asked for more, she would have given it to us because she also acknowledged the fact that this is something that this community very much needs um, and was very willing to do what we needed her to do to help us um, and support us to get this building. So I want to be very strong in the fact that she did guarantee us a five-year plan. Thank you. Others? Council Hayes? Yeah, I think I did just kind of reiterate, I think Council St. Clair and I sat on sort of the ad hoc committee that has met for over a year on this building, and I just encourage all councilors. I participated in the process, I think, to kind of echo what Council Rowan said. This is very much makes a lot of sense. I hope we all can support this going on the ballot this fall and help promote this to our community because I think it's important for us to do so. So I encourage all of you to try to support putting this on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Other <coughs> comments? <coughs> Not seeing any, uh, you know, with the others, I just I want to um, strenuously, strenuously uh, support uh, this um, um, item and hope that the community comes out and supports it. It is, it is an absolute need and not a want. So uh, with that, I move the question. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Oh, moving into new business. It is before the time. Um, the next item is order number 17-085. It is a first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 1301, the General Assistance Ordinance pursuant to Title 22, MRSA 4305.4. And I'd like to ask the manager to provide a brief overview before public comment. This is our annual uh, rite of passage, it seems. Every year the state advises us to increase our overall general assistance maximums. Uh, this gives guidance to the general assistance officer in terms of uh, when he meets with uh, applicants and as to what the eligibility levels are. Uh, there's really no local decision making other than the fact that we have to adopt it. Incidentally, we did inquire as to whether we could have this not have it come back to you every year, and in fact, uh, it does need require it requires uh, annual action by uh, the town council. So we look for your support. Thank you. With that, any general public <coughs> comments? Not seeing any. Closing comments. Um, any co uh, motion by council, please. So, so moved. moved. Second. And just for the record, the scheduled date for the public hearing and second reading will be September 20th. Is there any comments or questions from the council? Not seeing any. All in favor. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, order number 17-086 is a first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the zoning ordinance, section, section 5, 4. I, I'm horrible with Roman numerals. 6. Definitions and section 17, 18B, sorry, Higgins Parkway District. This has been offered to us by SEDCO. Um, a comments from the town manager. Yes, uh, Karen Martin on behalf of SEDCO has been working with uh, Mr. Miley, the applicant, 
she put together a very comprehensive memo that was in your packet uh, and for the public to see as well. Um, Jay Chase is here as town planner and will introduce just the basic uh, fundamental elements of this change. There's two or three components, as I recall. <coughs> three. So perhaps uh, if you'll permit, Jay can speak to all of them and then we can be very specific as yeah. to what's in front of you as part of this. Thank you. And if I might, I might actually speak to the next order as well, which is uh, actually the zoning amendment, map amendment change that it's a complete package, mm -hmm. um, but does need to be considered by council as separate actions. Um, as noted, uh, this is a request that was brought to SEDCO um, by the uh, um, <coughs> owner of Enterprise Business Park. That's Commerce Place LLC, and as mentioned, David Miley is here representing uh, Commerce Place LLC, um, with a request to take a look at um, uh, bringing in a new business to town, and more specifically to the Enterprise Business Park, at least in, um, with this request. Uh, it's Bluebird Storage. Uh, Bluebird Storage is a self-storage business, but they're a new style of self-storage business. They're not sort of the utilitarian building, metal building with the uh, overhead garage doors that are individually uh, accessed each unit. These are really, uh, this is a climate control building with internal access. It sort of has higher um, uh, architectural standards, really more in, in keeping with it an office building. Um, and so the, the conversation was around, well, how does one incorporate that activity with what the town's current zoning allows? So given that, um, again, it's well spelled out in the, in the memorandum that uh, Ms. Martin put together, but there's really three principal actions that the council is being uh, asked to consider. One is to consider an update to our definition section, which will create a new subset of storage units. Um, it's creating what we're now calling a climate controlled internal access storage facility. Um, and then creating that use is providing for that use as a permitted activity within the Haigas Parkway zone. And there are some performance standards that have also been developed with that, which are uh, established in your packet. And then the third item, which is subject to the second uh, uh, council action, is a map amendment. Uh, currently, all but one parcel in the Enterprise Business Park is in the uh, Haigas Parkway zone. Um, the one parcel, the slot 100 uh, Enterprise Drive, is in the B3 district as it abuts uh, part of the Route 1 uh, right away, and you should have a map uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the packet before you. And so the proposal would be to change that one lot to uh, Haigas Parkway lot, um, thereby enabling, presuming the council sees fit to move forward, um, the activity to occur. Of course, it would require still a full site plan review by our planning board before anything were to occur, but before that can happen, uh, the zoning changes would need to occur. I should mention that this was an item that was also brought to our long range planning committee. They gave it uh, consideration and had a favorable opinion. Um, and so um, for what that's worth in the council deliberation, I wanna make that known. Um, as I said, uh, Mr. Miley's here to probably speak in more details certainly can speak to more details as to the activity, but I'm certainly happy to speak to uh, process and um, others. Uh, with that, I'm going to open up the, um, sorry, I'm going to open up the public comments. Anybody would like to speak on public comments? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions for staff? Council Chiazzo? Yeah, I'm, I'm always very leery to make um, zoning changes without really understanding the background of why it was a B3 in the first place, especially with it, um, everything around it being of a similar zone. Uh, I know this is the only one in Enterprise, but everything on Route 1 that abuts it looks to be B3 as well. So can you address a little bit of the history of why this particular lot was zoned B3? Um, sure. I, you know, it, it, I think it harkens back to... Um, even before B3, much of Route 1 was our B2 zone, which was really our most uh, um, permissive commercial zone, really the type of zoning you see in, in sort of the Payne Road area around Walmart and such. Um, that was changed some years ago to, to try to scale back a little bit, still allow for uh, still a wide variety of commercial activities, 
but not quite the big box type activities. Um, and so I think it, when looking through the comprehensive plan, it really talked about the Route 1 corridor having those type of activities. Uh, over the years, the uh, Enterprise Business Park zoning has changed. Um, Higus Parkway zoning uh, was, in, uh, I can't remember when the, the Enterprise Business Park itself changed. Um, I will note that the, the, the exact point you just brought up was raised at the Long Range Planning Committee as well as to, well, maybe we should look at some of these other properties. A um, couple of things that were looked at is, one, the property towards uh, the south or heading towards Saco is in a contract zone, um, and so that certainly has its own set of uh, unique criteria. It's actually a property you saw earlier tonight. It's the uh, Land Rover site. Um, moving further up towards Town Hall, north, um, there's a few smaller lots um, which really aren't as conducive to some of the activities along uh, for, of the Higus Parkway, and so it was sort of felt that given this lot's orientation to Route 1, I think that was the other consideration. You'll see on the map there's sort of a, what we sort of generally call a jug ha uh, handle turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, so the Route 1 corridor really extends quite wide there. So the slot really does, in essence, set back from the principal corridor, um, and I think that was part of the consideration um, when the long rangers looked at it as well. The question is yes, Councilor Owens. So I, I just want to, a couple questions. First, just to clarify, the, the first issue that's in front of us right now is about changing the Higgins Park is, Parkway zone to allow storage as a use. It's not about changing this particular um, lot from one zone to another. Correct. You have two orders before you. Yes. Yeah. So, the, um, in regards to the first one, um, if changing this would allow storage in anywhere in the Haggis Parkway zone, we're not now talking about just this one. Um, okay, that's my question. I'll save my comment. Other questions? Not any questions. Not seeing any. All those in favor? Oh, well, I have comments though. Yeah. Oh, I thought, I'm sorry, yes, because I, I was thinking, yes, comments from council, sorry. Thank you. Um, so I, I really, um, I'm really concerned about this particular amendment. I, I don't think um, that it really, it, I feel like if we had wanted Hagus to be an industrial zone and filled with trucking and storage and uh, that we could have, we could have filled the, filled it up by now. I, I really feel like we're, we're, we're going for something here and I'm, I'm concerned that we're relaxing our standard. Uh, by allowing um, storage uh, as a as a use uh, when we change this zone, I'm really concerned that that if that this is a um, not in the best interest of um, the uh, um, really not in the best interest of the the area. I've, I'm, that's my point. Thank you. Other comments, Council Chiazzo? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess. Uh, if we're going to, I, I, I would suggest if we're going to allow the subset of storage to be discussed uh, or being changed, um, I, I think it is important to call out the difference between the mini warehouse storage ones versus this type of storage facility. Um, so I just want to be clear, is this amendment asking us to allow any type of storage facility in Hankus Parkway? Because right now they have probably one of the most liberal zoning ordinances that we have, correct? Um, no. There's higher design standards for the Haggis Parkway. There are, okay. There, there are yeah. higher expectations and higher design standards, and, and that was um, another consideration that was given by the Long Range Planning Committee is that in, within our commercial design standards, the Haggis Parkway zone has requirements, as I just said, that are higher than some of our other zones. Um, and you're right, uh, one of the key considerations is that this really is and acts, um, it's the same type of use as a mini storage, but it really behaves quite differently. Um, it has, as I noted, it's climate control buildings and all the access to the units is internal to the building. Um, so, ostensibly what we're hearing from is that what the building would look like is a professional office building. Um, there are examples of that in Southport when I think there's one right on the, on the, I don't know what the name of the corner is, Cash Corner, I think, or something it is, where there's, there's a it's not near climate Western control. Ave. I yeah, Western Ave, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I guess my, just my concern from our perspective of when we're, d when we're putting definitions in, I don't want to be so broad just to say any type of storage facility because I would be concerned about 
kind of the cube storage places with the garage door type look to it. So um, that would be my concern. No. Oh, um, I don't have a question. I have a comment. I was, Council Rome. I was just going to say I, I think I'm, um, I'm less. So I am concerned about the aesthetics, but I'm also concerned about the, the usage pattern. And, and if we're really trying to have a like a, a storage is kind of a, you, how often do, you, do people interact, go in and see their stuff? Um, so we've kind of the, the uses that I've, I've heard kind of envisioned for um, Hagus has been around um, restaurants and uh, housing and, and uh, you know office buildings and places where people interact. I'm just concerned with the, the change in the use. Yeah, but I also think that in terms of impact on utilization of services, I mean, this is a really low, low impact usage. I don't think they're going to be generating a lot of traffic. Well, I shouldn't say that for traffic low, but um, I, I don't foresee it being a kind of a high volume type of area. <coughs> so I don't know what kind of tax base it would generate versus the amount of resources necessary to maintain it and and uh, keep them up and functioning. So. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm fine for first reading if we want to move it forward, but I, I guess I would um, I, I would like to see some maybe uh, a little bit of a separate call out, maybe a split in the two of saying which, which is more allowed in Hagus, uh, maybe a little bit more of a restrictive allowment versus just storage as a, as a gen, in general. So if I might just a clarity on that point, I think the, the uh, try to find the page number for you. Uh, towards the end of the packet has the proposed zoning language and uh, of course there's no page numbers mm -hmm. on my copy although it looks like it might be a number eight. Um, the proposal is to allow as a permitted use in the Haigas Parkway climate controlled and internal access storage facilities subject to the performance standards and only within an approved subdivision. Um, so just just as a point of clarity, it is saying in the Haigas Parkway you can only have these climate controlled internal storage facilities and those are also being defined which is maybe a page or two back. Mm -hmm. There's a, a definition about what that is. So it is, it is not allowing as um, sort of the general storage what we all sort of typically think of as a mini storage facility with you know the utilitarian buildings and the exterior um, or the overhead door access to each unit, just for a point of clarity. Um. Any other comments or questions? Um, I, my comment is um, so I think that the request is actually consistent with everything else that is, if I understand this correctly, everything else that is around this going through the entire um, Enterprise Park. This is the only lot that is not under HP, it's under B3. So every other, and so there's gonna be, a, it looks like that there is at least being projected here a connectivity to the Haggis Parkway that to me makes it consistent when everything um, to the left of that will also be Haggis Parkway. So I don't see that this is being inconsistent with the design. It may have just been an oversight based upon maybe someone's input at that time to keep it B3. Uh, so I don't see this. The other piece I wanted to mention was that changing um, zones such as this from a B3 to an HP based on the surrounding areas is not inconsistent with prior actions because if we go across the street coming out of Enterprise Drive on Route 1 with that jug handle or whatever it was called, and if you go straight into Willowdale Drive, if you remember correctly, I believe it was within the last year, it could be within the last two, either the second or the third parcel in was changed as well in order to allow um, either um, mixed use or changed it from a residential, um, like an R3 to a B3. Right. So based on, on the contiguous pieces and the things that are happening, the council has taken this into consideration before and has been very favorable, um, understanding that we need to you know, kind of understand and appreciate the request. Yes, Councillor. Um, I just want to point out I agree with everything you just said, but it might be more appropriate to the next item on the agenda, which is the actual switching of the zone from one to the other. So this is this is the changing of the zone. I thought he was actually no mind I'm not gonna make my comment. Any other comments? I will just add in conversations with Mr. Miley, he has actively marketed this property for well over a decade, perhaps longer. Uh, and 
uh, has had some difficulty, obviously. So uh, he comes forward with this proposal, uh, it being very viable, and uh, he's anxious in getting some read from council as to whether there's some level of receptivity. But it's not for lack of effort. Um, it's really for lack of, uh, of tenants at this point. Any other yeah. comments? Yeah, I guess, again, you know, I just, my concern is the appearance off of Route 1. And I think the B3 was there for continuity and for reasons. And if, if Hagus starts to spread out more, then, um, I mean, we might as well just take, take everything from that intersection all the way down to the corner and call it HPZ for, for sake of continuity. So I'm, I'm not going to oppose it by any stretch of the imagination. I just have the concerns that I really want to express about the aesthetics from Route 1 uh, and about the impact that it could have on other parcels within the Hagus Parkway as well. So this is for the whole development area, not just this one lot. So, so but I will support it. I'll move it forward for first reading. Um, but I, 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 something I want to keep an eye on for sure. Any other comments or questions from Council? I, I would just observe that um, we can provide you a list of permitted uses in B3, and I think you'll find there's uh, arguably as, as intense or more intensive with less um, um, property, excuse me, performance standards. Um, so we really try to carefully and surgically provide for this use, uh, but in a very limited capacity. Any other comments? Not seeing any. All those in favor? That's six. All opposed? One. Thank you. Next item is order number 17-087, a first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendment to the town of Scarborough's official zoning map to rezone the parcel located. <laughs> In the Enterprise Business Park, identified as map U39, lot 4701, as shown on the Town Assessor's map from the General Business District B3 to the Higgins Parkway District HP. Um, are there any other, before opening to, um, any other, no, actually, I need, I'm I need to open it up to public hearing, or public comment first, so is there anybody that would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close that. Are there any other questions for staff from the council? Not seeing any, is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? I'm going to ask the um, probably the ridiculous comment of the night. If we do not pass this, since it's the map that ties into the previous question, what happens? The other could stand in zone. You're, you would be providing for another use in the HB zone, but the subject parcel would not be included in that. Yeah. So the former action could stand on its own, okay. but it won't solve Mr. Miley's challenge. Okay. If I could ask, then what what I know we want to stay away from contract zones. I don't like those anyway because they're too unique. Um, what What is the prevention right now from changing the B3 zone? Uh, so the need necessarily to change it to the HPZ? What, what's not permissible in B3 for this project to move forward? Well, I think we thought the, this new use, permitted use, was a better fit generally in the HP than, mm -hmm. uh, than in the B3 across town. So I was really trying to understand where else a similar use uh, might occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we thought the HP was a, a, uh, a better choice in that regard. And if I may add on to that, yeah. um, I think the other real consideration, I think it might have been the issue you've raised, is the higher design standards in the highest Parkway. Okay. Um, is there is the higher expectation, um, so there would be higher mm -hmm. controls around what the building would look like, and those have been shared. Um, with Mr. Miley, and I believe they've been shared with the outfit he's talking with as well, and they understand what those are. Um, so I think that was also a big part of the deliberation. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, order number 17-088 is a first reading and pu schedule a public hearing and it is a first reading and schedule a public hearing and schedule a second reading to repeal Chapter 308 Town of Scarborough Ordinance regulating <coughs> political signs in the public right of way. For a brief summary from the Ordinance Committee Chairman. Yeah, uh, this has to be done because it's a, not a content neutral uh, ordinance and that's why we're extinguishing it. Thank you for the brevity. Anyone from the public that would like to speak? Not seeing any, you close public comment. Is there a motion from council? To a move. Second. Is there any comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? Thank you. 
The next item is order number 17-089 is an act on the request from the police department sorry, to receive an anonymous donation in the amount of $3,600 for new speed radar sign, a new speed and radar sign for the Pine Point area. And this has uh, been presented to us from the police department. If the manager would like to give an overview before public comment. Yes, we've had a very generous donor uh, lives on East Grand Avenue um, come forward and propose to the police department, and I think they're very eager to accept this donation. Uh, that would be the purchase of one of these speed, electronic speed control signs. Uh, the one proviso with the request is that it be available and present in that Pine Point neighborhood during the busy month of July and August, but beyond that, the town could use it as it wished. Uh, the donor wished to, wishes to remain anonymous, so we provided a letter but redacted the name. Um, so uh, any donation uh, does require council action, so therefore it's before you tonight. Thank you. Is there any public comment? We have someone. <laughs> I, don't, I can't run across the street. Paul Kirby, 3 Granite Street, and I'm here representing uh, the people down in Pine Point, not only on the East Grand side, but also uh, we have two other busy streets there, King Street mm. and uh, Back Street, uh, Jones Creek Drive. And uh, I've had several conversations with uh, Sergeant O'Malley, great guy. And, you know, it's as we see... And, and agree upon, uh, people are driving faster and faster. You know, 85 is the new 70 on the, on the state highway, and 40 is the new 25 on East Grand Avenue. Uh, and now, for example, without, now that summer is over and there are no cars on the, parked on the street to go to the beach, it is now uh, Grand Beach Raceway. So it's, uh, and we, you know, I mean, everybody knows about the issues with the, with, this, with the traffic and the excessive speed. So we've gotten together and we uh, got a little donation hat and went around to the homeowners and taxpayers and came up with this gift. And uh, I've spoken with uh, Mr. Hall and I've spoken with Mr. O'Malley, uh, Sergeant O'Malley, that we may have a, I don't know, some sort of a, I'll probably have to get a permit, uh, but some sort of a baking or some, some something that I'm going to be knocking on doors and we're going to see if we can, you know, help out with the, not only, you know, with the funding, but also with the equipment needed to, you know, make that place a safer place. We talked about signage before and public safety, uh, and certainly this signage or these signs will come in handy. And as I had uh, mentioned to several people, it's not just for East Grand Avenue, but, and Sergeant... O'Malley recommended that we that the, that the uh, they have it at a, they move it from place to place. Uh, once it's in a place too long, people don't see it anymore. Human nature. But that we put it, and I've talked to people down uh, on on King Street, and it gets pretty busy down there, down towards the public beach. People are flying. So if we move it around during the summer, I think it would at least be a a, a good start at seeing if we can, you know, have the public be more safe. Uh, this summer with the new restaurant down at the, at the square, down at uh, Conroy's gas station, there are a lot more people walking on the sidewalks and trying to cross the street onto the beach side. The store was opened again uh, this summer, and hopefully it'll continue to stay open summers. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people crossing the streets, and it's, so it's, for, the, it's for the public uh, safety and, and peace of mind of everybody there, and that's, that's why we're doing it in Monarch come through with. You folks, uh, you know, the town came in uh, and, and gave us the two cleanings per week uh, uh, this summer again, which was wonderful. And uh, we want to, it's a way of saying thank you for that. And also, uh, you know, the public is, uh, deserves a, you know, what you're doing on the beach side. And we want to see what we can do on the, on the street side uh, to keep them happy and safe and enjoying, you know, Pine Point. So I thank you. Thank you. With that, is there any other public comment? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. And is there a motion from council? So Second. Any comments from council? Uh, Councillor Foley. Um, so at first I was a little bit leery uh, about this because anytime there's an anonymous 
donation and with some, some seemingly uh, string attached, it, it makes me a little nervous. But I am uh, grateful for your comments tonight and I'm, um, I'm impressed that the folks down at Pine Point are willing to fund something that they see as important for themselves um, and for the community down there. So, uh, and the fact that the town would have the ability to use that in other places. So, just think that's uh, that's a great proactive approach, uh, and I appreciate it. Any other comments, Council Chiazzo? Actually, I have, a, I have a question. In the letter, it states um, they want it in by as soon as possible, towards the end of September. Do we are these available off the shelf kind of things where we could just purchase one and have it delivered next week or something like that? I think they're readily available. Yes. They are. Okay. Any other comments or questions, Councilor Rowan? Oh, I, so I'd like to echo uh, Councilor Foley's comments. I think this is a, a terrific, um, uh, terrific use of um, really kind of self-control <coughs> to just kind of remind people that they're going around. <coughs> so I think that's a really, really good way to do it. I want to appreciate uh, Mr. Kirby and uh, for um, organizing and all the donors that came forward for it. I think it's going to be um, really improved public safety. So thank you. Any other comments? Um, I, I just want to add, I think it's always incredible when we receive donations, whether they're anonymous or known. Um, we have received many donations in the past for our police department, I believe, if I just some th simple things, um, some segways that were donated from a, an anonymous donor or at least a donor. Um, I think a couple of drones have been donated in the past and there's a lot of different equipment that we've always been able to receive and so I do appreciate the support that our public safety group does receive um, in getting those and so thank you to the Pine Point residents that contributed uh, very much and with that I would move approval. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, this is the item in which I took out of, um, I took out of or added as an adjustment. Um, so I passed this out and I apologize that this is at the last minute but I think the circumstances will explain why this um, adjustment and um, unfortunately because this is unknown there is really um, um, probably not an opportunity to speak because I'm going to have to read this as a motion because I don't want to have to read this twice. Um, and then if there's no objection by counsel after I read the motion and second it, I'd like to open it up for public comment um, unless there's objection, which is a little out of protocol. But the order is order number 17-092, an act to appoint a town council ad hoc committee to review established local rules and procedures for the administration of municipal elections and referendum votes as authorized by Town Charter, Charter, Town Charter Article 8, Section 807 and Chapter 302, Section 204.2 of the Town Council's Policies and Procedures. The committee shall be comp comprised of two Town Council members, the Town Manager or Staff Designee, the Town Clerk and one citizen. The Chairman of the Town Council shall serve there's two serves there, so shall serve as the council's first appointee and as the committee's chairman. The chairman of the town council's ordinance committee shall be the second appointee. Kevin Freeman, a respected Scarborough resident, shall serve as the citizen appointee. The committee shall meet as frequently as required, request the necessary reasonable resources to complete the review, including the ability to place any request with the main secretary of state's elections office for any necessary audits. The committee shall report to the town council no later than October 4th its findings and provide any recommendations for the council to commit or, to commit or, sorry, to consider. Is there um, any, um, is there a second? Second. And if there's no objections, I would like to open it up to public comment um, since it is out of kind of order uh, under our regular uh, rules. Is there anybody in, this, um, in the public that would like to comment? Not seeing any, I'm going to close the public comment. Um, I'd like to speak to this first. So, um, everyone, at least uh, most people, are aware that um, the next item on our agenda, which is 17090, asks us to recertify the July 25th school budget validation referendum. And the reason for that is because um, we found um, an error in the auditing process of entering um, those totals with the Secretary of State's office that there was a miscalculation of uh, packages that were counted. Um, that's going to be discussed maybe a little bit more detail. We also had a previous incident um, a, a while back regarding um, our process. And then last evening we had, an, um, while unofficial totals were presented, we found that there were 200, uh, sorry, 421 absentee ballots 
that were not um, counted because they were stored in the vault, safely stored in the vault. Um, the reason for this is that I want to make sure it's extremely clear. This is not about our town clerk. I have the highest respect, the greatest amount of confidence in her work. She is a dedicated employee. But I think that when we have these type of instances, at least the number of them, the council needs to take a leadership role in at least making sure that the safeguards are in place so that our public can be um, ensure that our election process is of the highest integrity. And I know for a fact that our Secretary of State's office has the highest integrity for our town clerk and for our election process, but we need to reaffirm that for them given the recent uh, situation that happened. So um, I had to kind of organize this rather quickly because I think that with an, an upcoming election, it's necessary. Um, I think that the form um, is what I'm more um, interested in or the intent as far as the composition and how other pieces might uh, occur as part of that. I, I'm open to flexibility. It's really about ensuring our citizens that we have a very good election process, and these are nothing more than um, unfortunate um, mistakes that happen with human error. It's, it happens. So with that explanation, I would like to turn it over to Council and ask if there's any questions or comments around this issue. Yes. Well, I, I just wanted to say that I think this is a really nice way to handle this, and I commend your, um, uh, the way that you've approached it um, and agree with everything you say, that we really need to just ensure that the um, integrity of the elections, because that's um, uh, a critical bed bedrock to the democracy, and it's really um, not a reflection on what um, has happened. I had the opportunity to observe um, some of the counting last night and was really impressed with how the um, – the way that it was handled, but you know, obviously there, um, it's pro it's seems to be um, open to mistakes. So um, just to be able to, to get that confidence back by just looking and examining what's going on, I think is a good way to do it. Councilor Hayes, yeah, to, to just a point of clarification. I think, and I guess it's a question for the town manager. I think Tom, you had put out a press release or something saying we had in asked the state to be involved. Is this, is this in addition to that role? Is this in coordination with that role? How, how do these two interrelate with what was put out in the press release? I'm just trying to... My, my intent in drafting this is to be in coordination with them. The town manager and the town clerk have been um, extremely professional and very proactive from mm -hmm. the first call that I received very early this morning. And so I simply wanted to coordinate this effort with their effort because we are, you know, when when we are looked at as the town, the town council is part of the town staff as often as how it's perceived. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to be extremely supportive of their actions and what they're doing. And I think that um, the intent is that this is uh, at this, in the same parallel motion. But so, so there'll be a, still sort of an independent state look into or audit or process? Is that, is that I first spoke with Secretary of State Matthew Dunlop today and, okay. and invited him to come and, yes. and do this. Whether there's a formal audit, a okay. report that's produced, this is not something that the Secretary of State's office does necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They do provide election, uh, election training statewide and are the supreme authority in this regard, so they're the obvious one to go to. And he was pleased to be a resource to us. Um, he was kind of noncommittal over the phone anyway as to what we'd actually see at the end of it. But mm -hmm. um, certainly I expect they'll be involved. I, I should say, unbeknownst to me, I wasn't even aware this matter was coming forward. I had initiated and made those calls yeah. this morning. Um, well, that's all. I was just trying to yeah. dovetail the two. I think the two can work certainly uh, well together. Councilor Piazza. Yeah, so um, I also want to very clearly and unequivocally give my support to town staff uh, and the work that the clerk does. Um, I know it may not seem like it, but the process is working. The checks and balances that are put in place found these discrepancies and addressed them. We addressed them quickly, clearly, uh, as soon as they were brought to light. And so I don't think there's a, a, any kind of intent or any negligence or anything on anybody's part, I think the process is working. I think we've come a little too accustomed to instant gratification uh, and immediate knowledge of things, and I think that puts a lot of undue pressure and stress on us to get immediate results that night <laughs> or certify it the next day. Um, so uh, unfortunately, like any production process or any you know, uh, or process-oriented system, um, there has to be a quality control procedure in place. <coughs> 
So um, I definitely agree the ad hoc committee is, is a good way to do this. Um, I do feel, though, it should be a little bit more, there should be a little bit more third-party citizen involvement, per se. Um, I, I, I won't make this as a motion, but I might suggest because this doesn't just impact referendums in terms of bond issues and things like that, it also uh, involves elections of officials. Um, I might suggest out re, uh, some kind of uh, involvement with the two recognized parties and then some third party groups, whether it's um, maybe clergy or, or Nancy Kroll or something, something that has a little bit more breadth to it. Uh, my concern with this makeup is not the, the individuals that are serving. It's the, it's the question that there are really four town related people, including counselors. Uh, and I'm concerned that the, in order to really have an impact on any evaluation or any approach, I think it, the, the breadth of the, of, of, uh, of, um, of the makeup should, should be broadened a little bit more. But uh, again, I, I, I support the process. Uh, I don't think that there's, uh, it's not like we're, we're discovering ballots that have been burned or double counted or stuffed. You know, it's a process, we go through it. Uh, and I would like to see recommendations coming out of this committee for process improvements, not necessarily just confirming that what we're doing is legal, uh, which I'm sure the Secretary of State will do. I have the utmost confidence that will be the case. But some recommendations on some better ways to um, put some checks and balances maybe or a little bit more recording process or something in there. Um, so I'd like to see the report out be a uh, series of a, of a couple of options or a couple of actions that we may be able to take as a council. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd kind of echo Councilor Closey. I, I think it should include a broader reach into our community. I guess a place where I don't think it should go is I don't think there should be at all based on ideology. I don't think the parties should be involved in this type of committee. But again, I would echo that I think it needs to be a broader reach into our community because part of this also is to make sure we you know, trust with our community. So I think it's important that there's, you know, we think about that representation. But I think it would be a mistake to add the, the party representation to the mix. Yeah, I just want to be clear. I, I'm not, I don't, definitely do not want to politicize this, but I, I, I'd like to have as many of the affected parties involved as possible so that there, if there are any questions or any concerns, there's somebody there to witness it from whatever side or whatever vested party there <coughs> may be so that there aren't questions <coughs> or concerns later on with the process or where those recommendations came from. So I'm not suggesting to politicize it in that light, more just an inclusionary <coughs> approach to say if they have a vested interest in the outcomes, uh, you know, I, I would include them because they are typically involved in this process on a regular basis. And if there are questions or concerns with how we got to those resolutions or those expectations or explanations, they're there to say, yeah, we looked at this, we saw this, this is how the process was carried out. But that was my only intent. Councilor Foley? Um, yeah, I think this is a, a very positive and appropriate response to, you know, an unfortunate uh, situation. There's, I'd echo what everyone else said. I, there's probably no one in town hall that I respect more or um, trust more uh, and uphold their integrity more than our town clerk. So um, yeah, certainly no, no reflection on her, but process can always be improved. And um, I would also echo what Councilor Kalsa said, I uh, would like to see a little bit broader reach and then some specifics around what to expect out of it from a product standpoint. Councilor Donovan? Yeah, I, I certainly support the initiative of the chair uh, to uh, have this examined. I also support the involvement of the Secretary of State because the Secretary of State's office has an election uh, organization in place. It does the training for these things. It's in a position to do uh, a review, make recommendations as to whether anything uh, that they see that might be improved uh, and we can all uh, improve the way in which we uh, conduct our affairs. If there is something, I think that's uh, important. Having the group go beyond that, I, th I think the professional involvement of the state is very valuable here, but going to public citizens, I don't think they know a heck of a lot about uh, uh, ballots and voting and the process. Other comments? Uh, just to provide some clarity in the motion as far as the charge and then the outcome expectation um, and then some context to both charter and our policies. 
Um, in, the, in the first sentence, the charge is very clear. The committee is to review established local rules and procedures on the administration of municipal elections. And the very last part of the sentence is also very clear what the expectation is. They are to, they are to report back to us their findings and provide any recommendations for the council to consider. The reason for that language is very specific to town council charter in section eight, <coughs> where it says that the town council shall approve all rules and procedures to the administration of elections. So that's why the committee was structured in the way that I suggested, because this isn't about outcomes, this is about the process. And I can tell you, having sat here since 2000, none of us ever have talked about the process in which we elect um, as counselors. We haven't talked about um, when do we use electronic balloting, when do we do a hand count. That's a process issue. That isn't about an outcome. And the political parties and the other interested parties um, really should have confidence in the town council. That's what we are elected to represent them on in determining what that process is, um, as well as the other facets um, that come into this play, as well as what is the appropriate communicate. I mean, one of the things that I would like to see is what is the appropriate communication of the results. Um, and the reason is that results like last night that were published so immediately and known were unofficial. By state law, they are not official until we approve them tonight, which is one of our next items. So, you know, the, like Council Chiazzo said, the audits and the checks and balances that occurred were accurate. Um, they worked, and they were supposed to happen. Guarantee we have another item that we kind of messed up a little bit on, but we can look at the process to determine. And so that's why I limited the scope, or at least the, the amount and the number of people on the committee, because I wanted to keep it truly to the executive level of looking at the process and supporting the town clerk's office. Um, and then we can talk about other aspects of that and outcomes um, with those appropriate parties. So that's, that was the intent, and I hope that you take that with the consideration that it was intended. So um, other comments, Councilor Chiazza? Yeah, and I just want to point out, um, you know, the, whenever you do a quality review process, sometimes it is important mm -hmm. to have um, for lack of a better word, someone who isn't an expert in that area because they're going to ask some, some questions maybe that aren't readily apparent to everybody else and they might be able to see it in a different light. That's my only intent with bringing others into it. It's not that I question the integrity of the council, this makeup at all. I, I think everybody who's listed by the chair is capable, professional, and will handle themselves with the utmost of integrity. I'm just saying if we're, if we're quote unquote experts in this area, uh, there may be some simple things that someone who isn't familiar with the process might ask, like, why do we do this this way? Or, you know, help me understand how come this works like this? And that might bring to light some areas that maybe we hadn't thought of. So it, my intention isn't for outcomes. My intention is for more to, to, to improve the process as best we can, because quite frankly, I don't think the results are broken. The results have never changed in any one of these outcomes. Uh, the, 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 the number of votes may have changed or the way they've been counted has been changed, but the outcomes, not once in any of these instances, either present or past, has the outcome of the election been affected by anything that's happened here. So it really is a process improvement question. And to do that, I really think it would help to broaden the aspect of it. I'll support the, the amendment because it has to happen. Uh, and, I, and I trust the integrity. I just think it, it would be beneficial to have uh, some uh, non-trained eyes on this, for lack of a better word. Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor of the, um, the uh, order number 17-092 is read. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. No. Just a point of clarity. Are we voting? Some suggestions were made, but we're voting specifically as it's drafted here. Is that that's that correct? Area? I haven't heard anybody ask for an amendment. Right. Uh, well, uh, then I'd like to ask for an amendment okay. motion that we include at least some other citizens at large on this list, as as we've discussed. If you need a specific, I'd say I, I do need some definitions of what some other means in a quantity. Two other, I would I would suggest two other citizens at large. A second. Comments and questions? Council Foley? So one of the, when I uh, made the comment about perhaps a broader reach or expanding, one of the things that occurred to me was, um, you know, I'm always amazed when I come up to, you know, election and the volunteers and the workers and the, from the citizens that we do have, I would argue they know far more about 
uh, how it has always worked uh, up here than, than I do. I've not sat and counted ballots or been a part of that back end of the process. And I think one or two of those folks who have had a lot of experience um, uh, doing that might also be beneficial to that group. Um, so and that, that's kind of what I was thinking. So I would support the expansion. Council so I, I can support an expansion, um, but I'd like a little bit more definition of who's going to be put on and how. If we just put citizens at large, we always get the question of how do you determine who's chosen, what criteria to use, you know, and there's always going to be somebody who says, well, I should be on that right. committee, and if they're not, then now anything that the committee does is not, is non gratis. So um, I agree with Councillor Councilor Hayes right. that I'd like to see it broadened, but I, I think we need to have a definition of who those people are going to be, may, if it, whether it's election workers or some definition so that I think if we open it up to just anybody in the general public in its first come first serve or however we quite base that, I think we're opening ourselves up for more questions I think than, than probable answers and outcomes. Other comments? I, I, I'll add as the drafter, I do not support this because there is no definition to two other at-large members. Um, who identifies them, who's responsible for approving them, um, who do they represent? Um, this was intended to be a controlled environment and this during the meetings, the committee comes and says we need more people and they can come back just as the historic preservation started out, came back and asked us for more members. The committee can do the same. This is really to get this initiated. Um, again, it's to look at process um, and unless the person, I mean I, I would have serious reservations unless the person is directly involved in the election process um, as far as I would be concerned about the ramifications that that could have and something that I, is not intended to be overly complex. Other comments? Councilor Rowan. So I, I support the amendment. I, I think that even without um, clarity of, of who uh, it is, I think that um, just getting more eyes on it is, is not a bad thing. I, I, I wouldn't want to go too far, I think two is probably a, a good number, um, just because you want this committee to be able to move and act quickly. So I'm going to support it. Council Donovan. Uh, if uh, the selection or identification can be made uh, to one's satisfaction, I think I could support expansion. But at this point, there's no identification of how it's selected or who these people are. And I'm not sure I need, I know why we need two as opposed to one. Uh. Any other comments or suggestions? So, with, I mean, you can um, empower the appointments committee. You can empower the chairman to make those selections. You can empower someone to make those selections. Um, but there needs to be some clarity for support in this because right now there's no clarity. Yes. Just a uh, question. So would that have to come in the form of a second amendment or a second motion, or could I could we add that clarity? It is an, it, well, it is an amendment. It's just that we're trying to get their proper language around right. that. Okay. Yes. Uh, I would suggest that the uh, counselor who made the motion to amend be asked if he would amend to include a method by which one or two individuals would be selected, and I would suggest that the chairman of the committee make that selection. So I guess if it's back to me, I, I guess I would, <clears throat> my suggestion would be the chairman of the committee and Kevin Freeman collaborate and come up with names they agree on as the selection criteria. Support that. <clears throat> Does that need a second or is that just? So just for clarity, because we have to put this into the document for the clerk's purposes. Second. So just for clarity, the amendment is to add somewhere is in here, and I don't know the proper placement, but we will make sure it gets properly placed, that we add two other at-large members appointed by the non-town employees. I mean, I think it would be not elected officials, non-town. <clears throat> will it be at the chair's, if I may, um, it would be at the committee chair's discretion as the only non-town or committee person on there. So you're, I, I just want to be clear. Well, so, but keep clear, yeah, so the, the motion would be inconsistent with the uh, overall because it says that the town council chairman will be the committee chairman. But you're suggesting that it's the, the, the additional two appointed yeah. 
between the chair and Kevin would be community members. They wouldn't be oh, okay. part of. Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't be part of elected officials right. or town government. They okay. would be okay. citizens at large, if yeah. you will, under that description yeah. of. All right. No, I missed this. I thought you meant who was going to make that decision. No, so no, I, I apologize. No. Yeah. Okay. I am still, un um, and I apologize. I am still confused as to the proper language. So you're at, so in essence, to be brief, you're asking that the chair of the committee and Kevin Freeman as the citizen already on the committee to use their discretion to appoint two additional citizens that are non-employees and non-elected? Yes. Okay. Non-elected officials, yes. Okay. If there's clear understanding of what the intent is, we can work on the yes. specific language. I think there is with that clarification. Okay. If there's no disagreement from the council or from Mr. Freeman, if he doesn't jump up and throw something at me, who's in the audience. Do you need a second? Yes. Second. We'll work on it. Yeah, we already <laughs> um, any other comments or questions? We've we'll got his motion, right? Well, it, we incorporate it into the overall motion. I just amended it. Okay. I think you have to vote on his amendment. Okay. So um, all those in favor of, of Peter's amendment to add two, source, uh, two other at-large members appointed by the chair of the committee and the citizen, of, um, the citizen appointee. All those in favor? Well, Sorry. Yeah. All those in favor? <laughs> Sorry for the confusion to the public that's watching. They're probably laughing. Um, <coughs> any other amendments or comments? Not seeing any, back to the main motion as amended, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Okay. Sorry. Next item is order number 17-089, an act on the request, nope, sorry, um, 090 act on the request to recertify the July 25th, 2017 school budget validation referendum election as recommended by the town clerk. And I'd like to turn it over to the town manager for comments before um, public comments. Yes, uh, the town clerk provide, I provided, I think, a very detailed memorandum that went into some detail in terms of the election process and procedures she follows. And in this particular instance, uh, explains um, how some of her post-audit or post-election uh, practices identified the fact that there were some hundred votes um, not counted and how that came about. Uh, as was characterized earlier, um, uh, these are human beings doing this uh, after a long, sometimes grueling day. And so it's no surprise that there can be some oversights. In this particular instance, the, the practice of the clerk and the election workers is to separate out, in this case, yes and no's and put them in lots of 50. And as a simple oversight, um, uh, two bundles were actually packed away and not counted in the final tally. Uh, upon further inspection, really looking at the voters list, uh, it was identified that there were 100 votes that were not counted and they were very easily identified. And thankfully in this case, they were equally split between yeses and noes, so there's no consequence. Um, Tony, I'm not sure if you have anything further you want to say about uh, this particular instance? Um, unfortunately, we did not catch this before these election results were certified by this council, and so we're back before you uh, somewhat humble, asking you to recertify the results uh, based on this revelation. Any comments from the public? Not seeing any. A uh, motion from council? To move. Second. Okay. Any comments or questions? Councilor Hayes. Just, just, just a point of clarity on, on both of these items, actually, 090 and 91. Is there any urgency to do this, this certification now? I mean, is there any consequences? Or my, my thought is, do we wait until, you know, we have the state come in and give us their initial findings before we circle back to this item? I mean, is there any consequences if we just table this for a week or two? I know that the council has to act on a resolve by the school board and it, it's done after they certify the results of the election. There's another step that the school has to take by certifying um, a resolution where those cost centers are and they mm -hmm. have to send that to the state, I believe. 
<clears throat> Beyond yeah, that, I, I, I don't know other than that. I do not expect the Secretary, Secretary of State to not ask them to come in and look at these particular instances. We may use them as case examples, but yeah. I'm not asking them to come in and audit these exact election results and practices uh, uh, associated with them. Okay. Uh, my intent was to have a broader, more generic discussion. Mm -hmm. These may, again, may be used as some examples mm -hmm. as to mm -hmm. um, how we can shore things up and employ some best practices. Okay. So I don't know how those results would change. Um, I don't no, expect them to change. And, yeah. and frankly, um, on behalf of the clerk, uh, we come with this order and the one following with uh, high degree of confidence that what we're putting in front of you is in fact correct and we strongly encourage you to certify them. Any other comments or questions for staff or for comments? Not seeing any, all in favor? One, two, three, that's unanimous. Thank you voted yes, right, Peter? No, um, no, I'm sorry. So all in favor was six, all opposed? One. Order number 17-091, act on the request to certify the September 5th, 2017 school budget validation referendum election. Um, if the town manager can give an overview. Yes, uh, we, uh, we had a similar but different um, occurrence last evening. Um, luckily it was detected immediately first thing. I think Cody was probably sleepless in her bed and, and uh, thought something was amiss and was uh, wise enough to come in this morning and very quickly deduce uh, what transact what what happened last night. Essentially, there was a one box of SD ballots that had been safely um, safeguarded in the in the vault. They were not removed yesterday and therefore not um, counted as part of the tally in the unofficial results that were la uh, released last night. Um, upon that revelation, we immediately sent out press releases that communicate with many of you directly. Uh, and members of the Board of Education, and Tody reconvened a uh, group of election workers to undertake that task. And in about an hour and a half's time, I believe, she was able, uh, and I think a number of councillors witnessed this process, uh, to uh, count and catalog those 420 votes. Thankfully, it did not change the final results, but we sit before you this evening certainly humbled and, and embarrassed that uh, we have another snafu, if you will, um, as was mentioned earlier, the good news is the process works. There are multiple post-election checks and balances, uh, and in each case we have um, detected our oversight and immediately went about the business of acknowledging that and correcting that. And uh, that's the best we can promise at this point. We're interested in working with this ad hoc committee and the Secretary of State's office. If there are things that we can do to improve so we don't find ourselves in this situation, I assure you, they will be uh, will be the first to implement this. This is not fun or easy for us to be here. And Tody, I don't know if you have anything further you'd like I to say. As a town <coughs> clerk, I'd like to acknowledge the issue of the September 5th election relating to the absentee ballots. On election night, the unofficial results were posted. This morning, we followed the process that we have in place to review our information for the night before. It was during this process we realized that an error had occurred, and we immediately took steps to correct the error. Our safety net has been tested in the past, and each time the protocol that we have in place assisted us in identifying the error, and each time we took immediate action to rectify the error. We take pride in serving our community and want to assure you that the integrity of the elections and its process is our utmost priority. Uh, with that, I'd like to open up for public comment. Is there any public comment? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Comments, Councilor Chiazzo. So I, uh, is, I appreciate the, the explanation by the manager and the clerk. I, I don't necessarily see this as an error. It was an unofficial result that was posted last night. We hadn't certified the vote. Um, I think that's a prime example of the process working the way it's supposed to work. Um, a, a little more concerned with the, the, the previous uh, election where we had already certified the results. Uh, that's more, a little, obviously a little more concerning to me. Um, but in this instance, I think, again, the checks and balances worked. Uh, the process worked. Uh, nothing had been certified. Um, the expectation of, I've sat through many ballot counts. Mm -hmm. It's a long, grueling process, and as soon as that number is announced, everybody scatters, and it goes out to the four corners. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that that's a, an unrealistic expectation on the part of the general public, and, and ours as well. I think if we expect that to be flawless every time. 
Um, so I, I, as I said, I appreciate the explanation. I don't see this as anything, uh, you know, egregious. I think this is the process working. Any other comments? I do think for public, uh, n just for public notification uh, given is that I probably should read the, I'm not sure if it's required, I think it is, um, at least the outcome and the totals so that the public is aware. Um, uh, presented for certification by the Town Council are the election results for the special school budget referendum election that was held on Tuesday, September 5th, 2017. The school budget validation referendum total yes votes for 2,402, total no votes for 2,226. There was one blank. There are approximately 16,816 active voters on our voter registration list for this election. It does not include same-day registrations. There were 4,629 voters who cast ballots in the September 5th election. There were 1,984 absentee ballots issued, of which 1,870 were accepted and processed. The percentage for voter turnout for this election was 27%. Um, with that, my only comment is, um, you are a class act lady, and so um, I hope that you do not take it personal because you have always served this community, um, as well as Tracy Cole, your assistant, and the rest of the staff that has helped out and volunteers uh, with our elections. So I hope that you completely ignore those who just cannot get beyond the level of hate that they're expressing on social media because I have full confidence in you both individually and then also as the council chair and so I appreciate everything that you do. I think it's absolutely important to also point out that again, the total number of voters came out to vote at a school budget referendum was greater than the total number of citizens in the city of Portland that came out for their own referendum. So that speaks volumes to the level of activity and the level of um, participation in our own community. So I have high confidence in what this outcome represents for the entire community and that it is truly represented um, so I appreciate everything that everyone has contributed and the support that they've given Tom and Todi and the others. Um, with that, if there's no other comments, I would move the question. Uh, thank you. Oh, absolutely, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I, I think it, j just to explain where I am, my prior vote and probably my vote on this, it's, I have the utmost confidence in Todi and what we do. But I do think this is a significant, significant issue for the town. Um, I think it's our responsibility that we need to do due diligence to make sure. So that's all I'm suggesting. I'm going to be much more comfortable by doing the due diligence that we've put in place here of having the ad hoc committee, of having the state come in and sh having them share with us any recommendations that they find. That's my comfort zone. Um, so it's not a vote of no confidence. I think we've been through the numbers and others, but I think for us to certify, it's our responsibility, our accountability that we at least do the due diligence steps that we need to do. I think that's our responsibility as, as council members. So I'm happy with what we've set up to get done, but I'm going to be much more comfortable on October 4th when we get the report back. So that's my thinking. Any other council comments? <coughs> council Rowan? Uh, can I just ask one question? Did, did we have an opportunity to check the, uh, the same thing that we discovered in July? Um, did we check that again in terms of the incoming voter list? Or? We can't open the incoming voter list. Until next Wednesday. Any other questions or comments? I just want to make sure we're managing expectations. We, with all the confidence and eyes wide open, are going into this and want to. If there are, if there are weaknesses, we need to identify them and correct them. If there are best practices to employ, we certainly will. Uh, but at the end of the day, this, these are human beings. I will guarantee you, uh, we will have errors going forward. And so, make no mistake. Um, it's an imperfect process, and we'll do the very best we can. Please have some level of comfort or confidence that um, when we identify problems, we, ident we identify them immediately. We go to every length we think is appropriate to make people aware of that and to correct that problem, um, and we'll certainly continue to conduct ourselves that way. But I, I don't see this um, as a perfect uh, system, and it never will be. I just, um, I forgot, it's kind of a, smiley face kind of response, but I wanted to mention to Councilor Chiazzo, only because Councilor Roy is here and she probably remembers more than I do. Actually, voter of uh, error in counting when it was all hand counted before, actually at one point did actually overturn the results of an election. It was when Representative Pendleton um, was um, running for re-election as a Republican and um, she, because I think it was like a couple hundred ballots were found in a box or found, they recounted it and 
Representative Pemberton lost, and Representative Poindexter actually won. So that was quite a few years ago, like 25 years ago. It was so. in 1996. 1996. So it has happened. I wasn't born then. <laughs> <laughs> and it was because of the pens, she said, <laughs> the ink. Um, so with that, um, any other, um, all those in favor? Six and all opposed? Is to one. Thank you. Non-action items, I don't know of any. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports, and um, just to mention the time, it is quarter of, I think, almost, yeah, quarter of 10. But uh, I'll start with Councilor Chiazzo. So I will be super quick. I apologize, I was not at the last long range planning meeting. Um, I had some business travel to attend to. However, Palooza is coming. Um, November, uh, so, sorry, September 25th at the high school is the opening kickoff at 6.30 p.m. Please plan on attending. Um, it's our opportunity to really get involved in the comprehensive planning process uh, and everybody's opportunity. From uh, We especially want a lot of citizens to show up. It's a great opportunity to get out there. 926, so September 26th and the 27th, then we're going to have a public open house from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day uh, in the space above Scarborough grounds. So the consultants will be there to answer questions, take input, um, chat, talk about the weather. I'm sure they're going to be there for a while. They'd love to see people come up. And then finally, on the 28th, the um, consultant will do a closing presentation at the high school at 6.30 p.m. to, I assume, just kind of wrap up everything that was discussed, um, certainly um, talk about some of the issues, and then probably, I would imagine, discuss actions going forward. So this is the public's largest opportunity to get involved and let your voice be heard, give feedback, uh, and become engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, two quick things. One, shellfish and coastal harbors really have been out of touch the last time, although I will report out and probably have a little more information. There are some issues that are going on with the shellfish commission sort of organizationally and other things. I'll have more information the next time we talk. Um, the finance committee meeting uh, committee did meet. We have started to do work on some metrics, so we're looking at dashboards for metrics and how to measure sort of financial performance for the town, and we'll be sharing that with you um, the next time around. We're, we're, we're kind of refining it for now. We also started doing some work on some financial planning, modeling, um, have agreed to kind of look at expenditures and, and look see what that looks like over the next couple of cycles, and we'll be kind of refining that as, as we go along. We had a first look at sort of debt schedules of what it looked like with the public safety building and with some other things. and. We're making some assumptions and looking at different assumptions about expenditure levels. So again, that's a work in progress we'll be sharing. And we do plan to get together the joint finance committee meeting with the Board of Education and really start sort of the primary, sort of the preliminary conversations for the next budget process, believe it or not, just where we are and how we're going to get there, what's worked, what's not worked. So that's kind of a quick update. Thank you. Councilor St. Clair. Mind to wait. Okay, thank you. Councilor Foley. Uh, so rules and policy uh, met. We had kind of uh, been keeping a, a laundry list of items that either came from other counselors or things that we self-identified. Um, worked well pretty quickly through those and, and have identified about three or four that we're going to move forward to our November uh, 14th meeting for further discussion. Probably the only thing you really need to know uh, from all of that was uh, conversation and discussion around um, the timing of budget materials and a uh, uh, desire to perhaps get those out a little bit sooner. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't feel it necessarily fell into uh, changing any uh, rule or policy in a formal way, but uh, Tom has agreed to work with us on kind of developing what uh, that timeline could look like for next year so that, you know, we can have the budget before we sit down to vote on it at the first reading. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Um, so the uh, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee met um, last night uh, back from summer hiatus, um, talked about a number of issues. Um, um, the most significant and the time spent the most was around um, a terrific binder that uh, former Councillor Holbrook has put together that um, kind of has pictures and um, the historical significance of all the properties that are on the um, the town list that's in our, our zoning ordinance uh, with the idea that we can then provide it to the um, planning board, uh, excuse me, the uh, planning department so that when questions come up, they'll know why those town, those um, sites are um, 
of interest and of um, to be preserved. So, thank you. Council Dunneman. The Ordinance Committee uh, met last week and I reported that out in the prior proceedings. Thank you. And for Chair, just a couple of items. Uh, first is I did want to mention that I have reached out to the school board to discuss um, the joint workshop opportunity regarding the ad hoc um, um, finance committee uh, approach, a uh, budget the committee approach. Um, have not had an opportunity to get back. She did need to go back and see what people's schedules were, although we might be able to achieve something in a conversation next week. Not sure if we're going to be able to have a joint workshop of the full boards, so I hope that we um, uh, might have a conversation. Um, everyone has a conversation with the finance committee members so that we can adequately represent. It's just everybody's filled with meetings, especially the school board now that school's back in session. Um, I did also want to ask if you could please um, return your goals document that I brought up a couple of weeks ago. I've received, I believe, two. Um, we'd like to get that tabulated based on our schedule. Um, it might, and based on the proximity to the next election and the end of cycle, it might just simply be an opportunity for us to share the outcome in a written document and not necessarily meet. Um, it might not provide the results that we need. And then last, as chair, I do want to mention um, that the uh, clerk has provided me with the ballot um, that will be uh, presented for the November election and I wanted to make that public. So on the town council, and this is, uh, they are in the order in which they will appear on the ballot. Um, for the town council, it will be Sean Babine, Jean Marie Caterina, Timothy Downs, Peter Hayes, Benjamin Howard, and Kate St. Clair. It will be vote for three. The Board of Education is Rebel Douglas, Hillary Durgan, Leanne Casalionis, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Christy McNally, and that is a vote for two. And then for the Sanitary District is Charles Anderson, Anderson, Judith Cavallero, Jason Greenleaf, and Robert McSorley, and that's a vote for three. So that will be the ballot that has been approved and is heading to the printers. And that's all I have for the Chairman's report. Is there a um, manager's report? I will shorten it and just focus on one thing that I think the public uh, is probably interested and in should, should know about. Um, I did attend a meeting regarding the, updated, uh, the updates to the flood maps. Uh, this was a, uh, intended and conducted for community officials. It was not a public meeting. Uh, but they did lay out very clearly what their timeline is. It does appear that they'll be uh, doing their publications in the Federal Register, which is one of their requirements in the month of November this year, so coming right up. And that will put in motion, after they've met those publication requirements, uh, the start of a 90-day appeal period. And that's something that we're keenly uh, keeping an eye on. Uh, we do expect, as a town, to file an appeal on behalf of 350 or so residents that are being affected, some of, many of whom, for the first time, uh, in and around the Scarborough Marsh area as a result of this, uh, these new maps. Um, Following that, uh, there's actually a, a year-long wait period, and they finally issue something called a, a final um, letter of determination. And then ultimately, they look for an effective date of July 2019. So the effective date is still a ways out, but the process is going to pick up speed very quickly. And uh, Jay and his staff is uh, paying very close attention to those deadlines, and we'll continue to provide updates to you. And a final note. This week we've concluded our, final, our food waste pilot project in the Pleasant Hill neighborhoods. Um, we think we have enough good data. We've got a survey instrument at the end of this process. Um, and we'll certainly share those results uh, with uh, the appropriate committees and then back to the full council when it's appropriate. So with that, uh, okay. I'm done. Great. Um, council member comments. Council Donovan. Uh, yes, I think we're all happy that the three referendum votes are, are behind us. Uh, I had really a, one perception is that the more people understood the school budget, the more people who voted for the school budget. Uh, we all liked it from the outset. We all voted for uh, for it as a part of the package, and uh, uh, and I think the school department has uh, very good leadership at the board of education and the administrative level, and I'm very pleased to be associated with them. Uh, I do want to uh, just say thank you to Jay Chase and Brian Longstaff on the Higgins Beach effort. Uh, uh, they put in ten times more time than I did. Uh, their, their courtesy in extending themselves uh, was remarkable to people who would call me at Higgins Beach and, uh, because I lived there. Uh, and uh, I did not want to play favorites. 
uh, and I relied upon their professionalism uh, and their patience, and it was really, uh, it was uh, a terrific effort, I thought, all the way along. And I really want to extend a thank you to Kevin Freeman and his Public Safety Committee and Chief Smolton and Thurlow. Uh, it is our highest priority. The costs really concern me that they are only going to go up because the bond market for bond rates is going up, guaranteed it. Uh, uh, you don't have to take it from me. You can ask anybody uh, in the business community. Uh, bond rates are going up. So now is the time for us to pass uh, the public safety building. Thank you. Thank you. Council Rowan? Um, so I, I just wanted to have a um, quick comment about the um, town valuation because I think that it, we were um, really unpleasantly surprised uh, last week when uh, we saw the, the number. Um, and just to explain what that is, um, so the um, uh, the town assessor's office at the end of the um, tax year will will come back with the uh, valuation for the town before the tax commitment can be made. And so at that point, we'll have a, our budget will then be divided by the um, the town valuation, and the net result is the the tax rate. Um, and in the uh, interest of trying to provide a, a more accurate um, tax rate projection when we're going through our budget process. Um, we uh, adopted a rule last year where we were going to use a, a, an average, a 10-year average over the, um, the property valuation as it's come in every year um, for the, the growth. Uh, and um, uh, this year when it, uh, and then provide a range because there's a lot of volatility in that number. Um, and so the, the range that we had come up with, um, we had had uh, over that 10-year period, there had only ever been two outliers and they were to the, to the high side. Um, this year we saw it come in um, very low. I mean, we had a 10-year average uh, growth of 1.3%. Um, this year's growth was only 0.24%. Um, so um, it doesn't change the, the budget number, um, but unfortunately the, it, um, uh, in this year it, it meant that the um, tax rate was higher than projected. Um, so I, I feel like there, I saw numerous comments about perhaps there was some kind of bait and switch or, or deception out there. I think there really was a highlight around there's a lot of volatility in this number and we were making an effort to um, communicate that by providing an optimistic and a cautious range. So. Dr. Foley. Um, I'll keep it brief. I, I also wanted to thank all the voters. I know some people still think that, um, you know, 27% of voters coming out for a, a special election is not enough, um, and I'd love to see more, but it, I, I think we could look around the state and we've far surpassed anybody, uh, any other community. So uh, I thank those voters for being involved, and I think it's even more important to stay involved. Um, so get to know the candidates as we start into this next election cycle. And uh, also just thinking about next year and how we can uh, continue to improve that and make that better. Um, I'm also just a little distracted, to be honest, uh, both by community tragedies that we've had uh, in, in recent weeks, as well as uh, Texas, uh, all the horror that we see going on down there, and uh, what's potentially coming uh, towards some of my family, and I know many, many other family members uh, in Florida. So um, I think sometimes it's, it's uh, easy to get caught into the weeds of this stuff. But when you think about uh, that bigger picture, um, we're all pretty blessed. And so I do feel lucky to be here. And uh, so, good night. <laughs> Thank you. Council St. Clair? Nothing? Thank you, Council Hayes. Yeah, just something quick. I think, you know, I think we're all glad the budget has closed out. And I just, as we think about it, I think next year will be challenging too. So everybody here or in the audience or at home, <coughs> any thoughts about a process and what we can do so we can as a community come together and have healthy conversations about the budget? Um, I'd, I know I'd be open to and I'm sure everybody around the council will be open to. So it's already almost that time of season again. So anything we can do to, to, to make that better, let us know. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'll just uh, reiterate everything. I appreciate the uh, the voter turnout. Um, I I do appreciate the the citizen interaction. Um, uh, hopefully we can you know move forward. Um, I I certainly appreciate input. Um, 
as long as it's positive and constructive and hopefully uh, now that the, the budget is finished and we're, we can move on and um, have maybe a little bit more civil discussions about how the rest of the town should be run and I uh, look forward to having those discussions. Thank you. Um, um, just a couple of things actually really quick. First, uh, again to the voters, um, I think the turnout makes us or at least makes me extremely proud uh, that we have a very engaged citizenry that really does care about our schools and cares about the direction of our community going forward because I truly believe in looking at the full budget as an investment and not just simply a cost um, because it provides us with the value of our houses, it provides us with the value of our community and the services we receive. Um, and if you uh, don't remember, uh, winter is right around the corner and soon you will appreciate the snow plowing that is done and the cost that that has, but uh, it's right around the corner. Um, I, I do want to thank, thank also the school board um, and school leadership and their contribution to this process. It's been very meaningful. It took a very different and new direction uh, from the leadership of the superintendent and the schools. And so I appreciate their contribution and I hope that we continue to develop that relationship as we go forward because I think it's extremely important to um, reiterate the importance of the work that we've completed over the last three years because we did agree when we started this process it was going to take time and it just proves that um, it will take time. And then last is that, um, you know, it seems like that we live in an age of not only where social media tends to hide people um, being able to say what they say to us um, in writing or at least on social media rather than saying us to face to face and I've been asked to kind of respond why I stay somewhat mute. I don't really engage in social media unless it's uh, personal uh, with, uh, you know, kind of my uh, inner circle that are friends and we talk fun stuff. We don't talk about politics. Um, and that is that as both as chairman but as an individual, I take my perspective from a positive point and move it forward. Um, I try not to look backwards in the rearview mirror. I try not to look at it from a hateful perspective. So I hope that citizens that send correspondences, whether it's group email or make comments on social media, I will not respond to you if you take that from a hateful point. I have received um, one very disturbing one this morning at about 622 that I think was nothing more than uh, um, just a, a diatribe of hate um, that talked about the town. And I'm not going to respond to that because that's not positive. That's what's dividing this community is that type of communication. It's not the seven members that are volunteering on this board. It's not the seven members that are volunteering on the school board. And it's not the 125, 150 other members that volunteer in this community on the many different committees. Um, it's those communications that spouting off um, and they're pretty hateful. Um, you know, whether it's about uh, our participation, our leadership, um, or about outcomes of things that are happening. We don't need that conversation. And so I hope people understand that I simply won't react to it. I'm going to move on. Um, and so I apologize to my co-counselors um, who expect me as chairman to make a response. I don't think that type of uh, activity is, is uh, both energetic or, or needed. Um, let it just sit where it sits. So with that, I do want to say thank you to everyone for a very long meeting. Uh, but with that, I would like to adjourn or uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. And all those in favor? And all those opposed? <coughs> None. Thank you. <laughs> Will, is this mic passed? Oh, yours. Uh, I think it's yours. I think it's yeah, I wrote all over mine. So, uh, yeah.